Yeah. So how did Joe? How did when this first started all coming out and stuff? We, did you know straight away that was you? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, they're yeah. just flashbacks, like straight away, instantly, just remembered. Like, and w- what's mad is before then, I always knew I was on someone's shoulders, but what I couldn't remember is how I got out. So up until I seen that, I always thought I've gone through a gap or I've gone. I've climbed myself over and I've just blanked it. I thought I've just decided to, my brain just decided to go, you don't want to remember that bit. So in my head, it was always oh, when I was on the pitch, some guy was just put me on his shoulders and said, I'll help you find your dad kind of thing. But when at the instance I seen that, I just started shaking straight away and panicking and I went, he pulled me out. I was falling into the melee of everybody and he's grabbed me and thrown me out. And then he's put me on his shoulders. And that, that it was only when I seen that clip that I got like a flashback mm. of that, you know what I mean? So up until that point, I was always a bit confused over how I actually yeah. got to be on this episode of the podcast is kindly sponsored by feel supreme feel supreme have been sponsoring the podcast for a number of weeks now they're an incredible company they've got the most diverse range of supplements i've got some here the cbd which i've been taking which is brilliant uh the uh, mushroom extract as well which i've been taking once a day they've got vitamin d3 vitamin c a huge range of different health supplements and you can get 10 percent off if you go to the code below go to the link below which is feelsupreme.co.uk forward slash leg it and you get 10 percent off by clicking through and going through their website through that link below please support them they've been a huge support of the podcast they've got the most incredible products products that i take daily myself and andy take daily as well so anything you can do to support them ultimately supports us Everything, CBD, vitamin D3, vitamin C, which is obviously vitamin D3, massive at the moment, uh, and vitamin C, obviously really important uh, for immune support. So go to the link below, click through, and you'll get 10% off your order. It's the Legged Podcast with myself, Tom Wickstead. It's me, Andy Grant, and this week we have John and Joe. Nice to be here, lads. Nice to, nice to be here, mate. Really yeah, good right. to be here. Thank you very much for both of your time, yeah. Really no appreciate it. Just learned that this is a new thing. You haven't really done this no. type of thing too much. No, we're not that famous, yeah. are we? No. Is the letter pass said? No, first time for the podcast, no. so uh, yeah. It's, uh, Bagged an exclusive. Bit of a yeah, scoop here, Tom. Yeah, yeah, we don't yeah, fuck yeah. about here. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be a really interesting few hours, I tell you. Mm. Yeah, well, it, I mean, <sighs> your story is... It's so sad and so interesting. And what I find compelling me and Tom were just speaking about is uh, I, I kind of have, you know, I've got a picture there of the lads I was in the Marines with in Afghanistan. I've got a bond with Ian, the guy I was blown up with, which not a lot of people could, you know, not yeah. many people get blown up in Afghanistan. So <laughs> me and him have got this bond that is, you know, unbreakable. You've got a, a similar bond in many ways. It's not many people will have been through what you've been through and the fact that you're coming on to share your story and everything that's been impacted uh, it's listen I'm genuinely you know really looking forward to speaking to you so thanks again it's no problem yeah. it's a privilege to be honest because uh, I remember when, when the story first broke obviously a few years ago now um, I think we were both concerned about the way it could be conceived by different people so we reached out to a number of different people around even some like the Hillsborough families and stuff I know a couple of them really well and um, just saying to them you know we're potentially gonna this is gonna happen What's your sort of feelings? And every single one of them said the same. They just wanted us to ensure that you get your story out there. And and then it, at the time, before all the courts and um, before all the cases had been sort of um, announced, it was a good way of keeping the momentum going. So people then were talking about it. And obviously, the story we've got is a little bit different. Um, what was sorry? What was? Why did you think there would be it would be viewed negatively? Honestly, in case um, people thought like you were glory hunting or wanted to be on the telly and you were trying to like look at Hillsborough in a different way or looking at your situation in a different way and like why would you want to be on the TV we never wanted to be on the TV like, we just wanted to meet up and sort of make friends and, and just be together really and just be good mates but then there's another darker side that people could think oh you're only doing it because of this and we're like no not at all mm. so I reached out to some of the families just to say listen this is what potentially happened we could be on a TV tomorrow and this is this is the story and this is the reasons why and they all said exactly the same thing go for it and mm. get your story out there because it's great to keep it topical mm. so for something like this and especially with you guys as well we completely trust rather than um, any other sharks in the media <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's actually a real privilege to be here so thank you yeah yeah mate going back obviously so I think I don't know I always say when these sort of stories and, and it's 
you know, it's great for me to be in the company of both yourselves. I've never met anyone who's who's who was there at Hillsborough, so this is a, a you know real privilege for me as such. And obviously to hear th what obviously happened on that day that everyone knows about. So, I mean, I don't know where the best place to start is. Maybe talking about the run up to that and when you'd booked the tickets or how you yeah. all ended up. I, I think yeah. just just on that though. I mean, you were eight and sixteen. Is that yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Match, match going reds at that point. I'd yeah. like to kind of know that yeah. that season. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I don't even at that age. I'd been to the eighty-six cup final and yeah. the eighty-eight cup final as well. Plus, I've been away quite a bit at that yeah. point, even then. So, kind of like fucking how's you young man? Yeah. From a really young age. Like, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was quite used to the away games already, so you know, yeah. my mum was happy to pack me off with my sani and off you went kind of thing. So by then I was quite seasoned at going to Wembley or Anfield South as it's own, isn't it? Yeah. So it was uh, leading up to to Hills, but it was just all. I thought about that a lot because um, and, and what I mean is on the day certain things happened, and because of your experience of going the game. Even at sixteen, you knew what to do, and and, and you, not what to do. You knew you knew how to keep yourself safe in certain situations. And when it arose, you took that opportunity. And and realistically, if I hadn't been going the game as much before the April '99, I, I think we could have been a completely different story. Really, mm -hmm. too. Because you were just used to it, used to crowd, you know, used to the movement, and then you were used to knowing something wasn't right, and you knew it wasn't right instantly, mm -hmm. and, and there was something wrong, and and you could feel that. Um, and then the certain situations for me that happened but on the day that you just knew, well, I've got to get out of here. Mm. And because you're still only 16, I was only a kid, standing on a bar and walking across people and like getting passed down and that sort of stuff was just normal. So they're just like, yeah, it's yeah. like this. It's not a drama. Who are you going the game with, Joe? I went with his dad and his, uh, his brother and one of their mates. So we'd all kind of, when we got in there, we were kind of all separated. I was still with my stepdad, but we kind of lost the other two a little bit. And then obviously, when things started to, to happen, I became separated from my stepdad as well at that point. But yeah, you know, get, getting back to like the build up, as you're saying, on the yeah. way and all that kind of thing, you know, it was little daft things as a little kid that age, getting took two hours across to Sheffield <laughs> felt like 10 hours to me, you know what I mean? Like cold and it was like being agitated. Oh, are we there? Yeah. Every yeah. day. <laughs> and then daft things like them pulling over a car, I remember. You know, on that snake's pass, is it? Snake's yeah. Passes, yeah, yeah, it? yeah, yeah. And there was a sheep, you know, a stray sheep on the road, so they're like fucking picking the sheep up and they're going, like, we'll put this in the boot, we'll have that for dinner when we get home after dinner, let's get to Wembley and all that. <laughs> carrying this fucking sheep, you know, and so I'm laughing my head off, going, making my journey better, you know. So the atmosphere was great, you know, obviously leading yeah. up to it, we're all excited, we all can't wait to get to the match and, you know, getting to the grounds and get, getting outside the grounds and the lads had a quick pint. And then it was like, do you want to go to the shop and get yourself some sweets and all? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just, it's little things like that that stay stick in my head. Like we're crossing the road without holding someone's hand and going to the shop and thinking, oh, I've just crossed that big road there and they're about to go to the lights. You know, so <laughs> it's, it's little things that stay in my head about the day. Yeah. Leading up to it is like things like that. I'm walking out thinking I'm like the, the bollocks, like, you know, because I've got my, my wine gums and my can of cherry coke here and I'll oh, cross this road again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was like where my head was at, building up to it, being so young, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah so like that, that was kind of my like earliest memories of the day leading up to obviously yeah. the madness like that followed after it, sort of thing. I'd had a funny one because uh, I was 16 <clears throat> and um, loads of drama going on at home. Um, and drama being with um, my dad's married to this woman who I hated, <coughs> and um, so your stepmom, and we didn't get on at all, and uh, she's a horrible woman. But then um, during that period, I was grounded, so I didn't have a ticket. I knew my dad had, <coughs> and I think it was about the week before I, I got grounded for whatever it was. I got no idea what. But on the on the day, he said uh, you can come. So I was like, oh, brilliant, I was made up, because I was obviously gutted that we weren't, that I wasn't going. He was still going to go. My dad and my sister, me and my dad and my sister went to most matches together. So I knew I was going to go on the morning, but obviously he'd kept it from us. Um, and we actually, because we were going to Sheffield, even though it's not close, we actually had to go to Nottingham first, drop air off, and then come from Nottingham back into Sheffield. So it was really bizarre afterwards when you see all the chaos happened afterwards and the weeks and months following that saying all these excuses about fans couldn't travel together we did we got the smaller end not the cop end because of fans clashing and all that we traveled with all the nottingham fans from nottingham in, in a car in our car 
But on the mugs way and the stuff, we had the Liverpool out, and obviously no drama. Parked the car that end of the ground, walked up with Notts Forest fans, no drama. You know, it was all good. So there was no problems there anyway. And it's just, we got to the game, then me, my dad and my sister. Um, and, and like I say, we went to a lot of games together. So it was interesting on your little sister. She's, well, she's 18 months older than me, but she's little. So uh, with my little sister there, yeah, it's tough. What's, um, what's interesting straight away is I think, like you touched on, some of the... Um, the stories that got told, you know, in the weeks and months after it, straight away is so different than, you know, an eight year old so excited to be running across the road, you know, yeah. and all that and, you know, someone travelling in a car with the with the dad, the sister. Yeah. Mm. Already that's just a totally different picture. What was what was painted and yeah. this hooligan well, kind of feel and this. We, we you know, didn't we didn't fit the pro forma though, did we afterwards? There was quite a few things where like I've told that story in my statement before, um like every every single time that you know, we travelled with the Nottingham Forest fans basically because we were on the same motorway, we parked car in the same place, we walked up to the ground together, all that, and there was not like one eye out of any bother or anything because mm -hmm. everyone was just chatting and you know everyone was looking forward to the match, so there was no drama there at all. And obviously that was completely twisted afterwards mm -hmm. to a different story. Um, you know, I was me, my dad's really strict on some of the things, and there was no way I was drinking. I was sixteen, you know. Mm. I mean, my dad never had a drink because he was driving, so he never had any, anything. Mm. And he was eight, so we hadn't had a bed. Well, I don't know. We might have. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back to my. It's funny because my first experience was going. The match was in. Um, it was in '96 with my dad. He took me to FCC on. It was. I think I was around that time. Maybe it was seven or eight. I think. Well, I must. I must yeah. have been. Yeah, it must have been eight. And then my first away game was around about 16. Mm -hmm. I'd, uh, I'd went to Birmingham away. I told me that I was going paintballing for the day and me and, <laughs> me and two of the lads went to Birmingham. That's um, a, tough tip, a tough trip as well, away, that one as well, Birmingham away. But, it, but talking about like your away yeah. and especially yourself, Joe, when you're talking about the little things, you know, I was on, on my own on the coach with like two of my mates with 15, 16 and stuff. Or might have been even a bit younger, 14, 15. It's like all those things, the excitement and, and, and what you're saying, isn't it? It's um it's 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 like a massive adventure, isn't it? Yeah. At that young age. Definitely. Huge, yeah. Definitely, you know, like I say, even like at different times then, but like I'd just be put on a coach to meet my stepdad at the other end a lot of the time in away game. So I'd be on the coach like if we were playing West Ham away for four or five hours, just sort of like itching, come on, get, <laughs> to, get to get off at the service station and bring them to go, you know, for a piss. In case the coach yeah, allow it. Or I can't find the coach when I come back, so I'm sitting there like that old minute, like, for five hours. Like. I've heard Jamie Carragher tell a story when he said uh, he went to Wembley, I think he might have been watching Everton, and there's half fella like, dropped them and said right I'll, I'll see you in there or something and it, like they had to find them <laughs> find each other in the grounds like that's how it was then I guess yeah, wasn't it it's just normal yeah it yeah. was it really was there was no difference to that and it was some of the things I was thinking about before I come here you have to explain some of them things because yeah. like right now imagine saying there was like a little eight year old that you put on a coach and yeah it just wouldn't happen mad isn't like, it? it just <clears throat> but that was it was just normal. Sign of the times, I guess, yeah. It's mm. like even on the old cop, it'd be like, like you'd have the goal and then obviously you'd have the six yard box and then there'd be like a little, just a like white stripe on the end, you know, off the pitch and you'd yeah. go right on level with that. Yeah. <laughs> just, just, just go up and down as much as you can, but I'll be yeah. on level with that. So if you were like, yeah. I want a pie, I want to go for a pee. Or That's it, yeah. If you didn't have an echo to pee and then and you actually went to the toilet. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? You'd be looking for the white line on your way back. Yeah. And then you'd just be like, but you'd always, people are passing over and I'm, I'm up yeah. there and then, that's it then you get to see the back yeah it was obviously a different time to now yeah. I mean now it's so easy to get get to your seat like mm. well you should be anyway shouldn't it but um there's little things as well like mobile phones and it's all that stuff that you yeah, probably don't you even forget, think about isn't it you forget don't you yeah. yeah well all that ties into the day you know every, everything ties back to that you know it's different times so uh, Saturday happened Sunday went to my nan's Monday I went to school went back to school on Monday and um, I had a uh, GCSE exams within, so I was 15th, so within the 17th of April back in school, and I think mine started something like the 4th or the 5th of May, so within two weeks I was doing GCSE exams, and um, I mean, my wife talks about this now, she's like, what support did you get? And nothing, I went to school on a Monday, and even a couple of lads that you knew, knew you were sort of going the game, or heard you'd gone the game, waiting for you at the school gate to see if you are actually going to come in, stuff like that. Jesus. So it was, uh, but yeah, straight back to school on a Monday. And it was just crack on that, you'd be all right. Um, which is quite bizarre, really, when you think about the same situation today and then things that would have happened afterwards and even counsellors and people talking to you, you know, making sure you're okay. And 
uh, PTSD and te- uh, all that sort of thing. Teachers yeah, explaining teachers. all of that, yeah, yeah, yeah nothing. Yeah. No, there was a couple of lads from our school. Um, I, I went to school in North Wales in Flint Eye, and a couple of lads from our school um, were, were at Hillsborough, and I seen some of one of them about the Tuesday afterwards. And as soon as I seen him, like pair was just broke down in tears in the corridor, like and just give each other a hug because he just I knew he went and he knew I went the game as well. And you just sort of see him in the corridor sort of thing because you had no idea if he was okay because again no mobile phones or anything like that. You you had no idea, did you? So God, yeah. even things like you know social media, it's like all only people are knowing about it is what's in the papers and on the news. And obviously we know that wasn't what was true. So yeah. no one's getting anyone's personal accounts of it, really, are they? No. Not at all. No. That's there's some beautiful things about social media, meaning finding each other's one. Yeah. And that is, you know, well, that's tremendous. How that started, wasn't it? Like, yeah. I just put up yeah. a little post on Facebook after one of the documentaries of theirs because it showed quite clear footage where I'm on John's show. I've never seen it before. I, I didn't see no, it. No, I mean, so I was like, okay, now that, that, that's me. That's the fella that. Because at this point, I don't think it's a 16 year old boy. I think everyone taller than me is a man, you know. Yeah, least, of course. It's a 56 year old man who's sitting <laughs> there. So I put a post on thinking, that just might go to like, you know, suck a few shares and then it'll just go to like a local pub and it'll be someone sitting in the pub and they go, oh, John, I think that's what you there talking about. That's in my head how I've seen it working. No, someone texts me going, that's had 140,000 shares or views. Or I'm like, well, what are you talking mm. about? Jesus. I just thought it'd go down to a couple mm. of mates and someone might know them, you know what I mean? Yeah. And then obviously it exploded and then that's the next thing you've got media. All of a sudden have your mobile number and God knows how because I didn't give it to no one like. So whether they've approached someone who knew me and they've given me a number out, I don't know, but it just kind of went nuts. I know, I know we're jumping a for, forward a little bit, yeah, but, yeah. but it's kind of, is it, no, no, no. So honestly, I just wanted to get this clip because the, the clip is, there is a there is a video, isn't there, which shows you you it on. A, it was on a BBC Two program. It was. Um, so if I type, what do I type in here now, just so um, I can just it, show it to? Do you know what? The clip itself is on a BBC Two documentary. And it, it yeah, I've got it from the. the, the I think they showed yeah, on ITV. ITV, 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 ITV News. So what, yeah, do I, what should I type in? ITV, uh, ITV News, Hills. Um, or no. I, it sounds ridiculous, but I know what it's under. It sound, I'm not being a dickhead. Hillsborough Hero, it's under. Yeah, Hillsborough Survivor meets Man Who Saved Him, if you type that in. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, that's it, yeah. I won't so play the. It's just, it's just so I skin at there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that one there, that yeah. one there. That's so let me just that one. So this is mad. This, this yeah. So how did Joe? How did when this first started all coming out and stuff? We, did you know straight away that was you? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, me too. Just flashbacks, like straight away, instantly, just remembered, like. And w- what's mad is before then, I always knew it was on someone's shoulders, but what I couldn't remember is how I got out. So up until I seen that. I always thought I've gone through a gap or I've gone, I've climbed myself over and I've just blanked it. I thought I've just decided to, my brain just decided to go, you don't want to remember that bit. So in my head, it was always oh, when I was on the pitch, some guy was just put me on his shoulders and said, I'll help you find your dad kind of thing. But when at the instant I seen that, I just started shaking straight away and panicking and I went, he pulled me out. I was falling into the melee of everybody and he's grabbed me and thrown me out and then he's put me on his shoulders and that. That it was only when I seen that clip that I got like a flashback mm. of that, you know what I mean? So up until that point, I was always a bit confused over how I actually yeah. got to be over, you know, come out, actually get out of the ground. Because I remember everything leading up to it. I remember sitting on a bar. I still actually had me two tickets in my hand. They hadn't even been given to anyone, so I was still holding yeah. on to the tickets because the reason I was holding on to the tickets when we were outside, they opened obviously the gates. And a couple went, yeah, I'll come through here. So obviously we all just assume oh, we're being told by the police to go this way. We'll go this way, and then when we got there, it was like one of the I think it was my step stepdad's brother's mate went to the left because he was in the left, and then there was no one there to say go this way, go that way. The other obvious thing was well let's all go down the centre because that's where everyone seems to be going. So we did that. I still had all the tickets, which was questioning why have I still got all of these tickets? I don't worry about it. We'll sort it out in a bit. I don't know what's going on. Goes in. And then it was to find a bar so I could be sat on the bar so I could see the game. And then I just remember, like, like John said, alluded to earlier, you, you kind of know when something's not right. Mm. And I could just feel my legs a lot like more sore than what they normally would be when I was getting put on the bar. So I was like, this is really hurting to the point where I was getting quite upset. So I was like, this is really hurting. 
it's in your legs were being pushed against the bar like, like basically normally like it, when you've been on your own cop you just fall and fall yeah. forward and fall off and then someone will pick you up and put you back on but obviously at this point I'm just kind of like go, going like that and I can just feel like waist down I thought I'm in a lot of pain here this is hurting like so he stepped out obviously being a lot older he, he got on so that, that, that there was something seriously bad, bad going on and he's picked me up straight away and he's gone get the kids out get the kids out <clears throat> so at that point i just remember you know like crowd surfing down getting pulled down to, to towards the front but then at that point up until i'd seen this footage i'd blanked that bit out i knew i fell off people but i couldn't remember then if someone else helped me or bumped me over or or if there was a fence gap i just i, I didn't remember that not to take you back, Joe, but is that the first time you knew? I mean, getting into the ground, the walking up, and you said about before the shops, you're walking up the ground, getting in there and stuff, and all that was it was okay for you and stuff. It yeah, wasn't. It was, it was not. I mean, outside the grounds, it was it, it was chaos, wasn't it? It was just. Yeah, the gate was it, it was just like there was police horses banging into you, and you know, they, they, no one seemed to. There just there was no control. Yeah. And people were just kind of like what's going on, what's happening? And then people are shouting and asking questions, where, where, where the fuck are we meant to go here? What are we meant to do here? You know, can't get in that queue. There's no there's no queues, not, no organisation at all. Mm. But all these police running around, that just looked like they didn't have a clue what was going on or what they were to, you know, how to control that situation. Um, and then, like I say, we just heard that voice that just opened that gate, one of those gates, and just said, come through here. And because it, it was a police officer, we just went, well, obviously this is the, the right thing to do. We're being told to do this, so this is what we'll do. So we just followed that instruction and then obviously at that point it was, well, where do we go now? There was no stewards to say, go to the left, go to the right, it's busy in here. It was just, well, there's the big tunnel, that's the main tunnel. We just assumed we'd go in there and then you'd split off whatever direction you wanted to go into then, you know, when you were actually in the stand. But mm. They were just feeding you in there like that, yeah. They weren't even doing that, there was no one, there was just there was no, there was one just no one there at all. There was no one about at all to say, go this way, go that way. You just were left to it, so it was like, the obvious, you didn't even know that there was... Bits side to gates. the side, side no. gates, you didn't even know. No. So unless you knew the ground, you you wouldn't know that you could go kind of like... And you hadn't been way. to the ground before, I so was know. it... No, no, no. I hadn't no. been there. That's first time for this, so... Um, you just didn't know, and mm. because no one was instructing you, the obvious thing was, there's the main entrance, that's obviously the way in, mm. and we'll just either go to the right or the left, whichever looks the quietest side, but obviously it wasn't like that when we got on there, it was... I think you do forget sometimes of like what logistical and it, I just mean this from just the amount of people in in a football ground. I don't mean it from police or any any of that sort of that when there's a lot of people it is it can obviously it can be dangerous but it's just a logistical nightmare trying to feed figure out to feed people different ways and yeah. you know like you just said like if no if there was if there was no one to, you know if you know there's no one guiding you then there's that many people just feeding it, through it's just it was it was a really strange thing when we came around the corner on the pavement and again you know i'm 16 my sister's 18 and i'm my old fellow and we came around the corner and it was just carnage at the back of the turnstiles to get in so there was whatever there was four or five turnstiles whatever there was I and mean, obviously we were down the wrong end because we should have been in the cop end with all the local fans we had and all that versus forest whatever but then um we come around the corner and um it was just carnage so you're looking and thinking well, we've got to go in there, and that's ten style number two. When you're looking at your ticket, well, we're in number two, so we've got to get over there. How are we going to get over there? So you sort of try and join the back of a queue, even though it's not a queue, it's just a mass of people. And then all of a sudden, there's a load of other mass of people behind you. And then um, we had a bit of drama in the queue because, um, you know, my dad's got to look after me and my sister, but I'm tall enough, and I'm, you know, he sort of knew I'd be all right, but that's why he's got my sister. And then there was a copper on a horse. He was spinning a horse around everywhere, literally banging into everyone. And everyone's giving him loads of grief time to back it in. And then he was hitting a couple of people with the sticks and stuff. And everyone was just like, what is going on? And obviously the pressure was building, pressure was building, pressure was building. And no one was getting in the turnstiles. There's more people coming behind you. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And I, I, I don't mind saying, you know, I was Andy on my feet and I, I knew it'd be okay. And it got that bad. I climbed on a wall, jumped over the top of the turnstile, as if some loads of other young lads had done the same, jumped over the top, and then I come the other side of the turnstile, and I'm on the other side of the turnstile now, still with my ticket and everything, obviously, because I haven't been through the turnstile. But stood there and was like, what's going on? Because, like, it's just, it was just, it was really was someone was going to get it outside. It, it was, like, horrendous. It's so hard to imagine, as someone who goes, <clears throat> goes to match season ticket, it's so hard to imagine 
that type of chaos yeah. and like jumping over a turnstile right just to get in because because we we'd get I think our turnstile was like number two and and number two was over there so it was one two three and whatever was around here and we we'd gone that side so there's like a wall here so we were getting trapped up against <clears> the wall and that's why I've gone oh dad I'm out of here and me and my dad got split up and I went I'm gonna go and see what I can sort out the other side so anyway jumps to the other side and then the stewards and stuff are there and you're like lads what's going on like there's people getting here out there and we'd be saying all these things and next thing you know the gate opens. So I'm on the other side now, and the gate opens, and, and there was a there was like one or two coppers knocking about, but everyone's coming that way, like Joe said, because they've all said come in that way. So I just waited for me to have my sister thinking, well, they're going to come in in a minute. I was through the turnstile, through there. Is this the gate that you said, Joe? That the, the same one. Yeah, yeah. And then as soon as, and then a little whatever it was, five ten minutes, and then next thing you know, I see me dad and my sister like so we grabbed each other, and then we were together again then, and we were like, God, what was all that about? You know, it was terrible. What was all that about? Madness. And then obviously you're still in that frame of mind going, fucking that was terrible, that someone's gonna get it hit there, you know, it's terrible. And you look up and all that was in front of you was was the was all in front of you was the tunnel. And there was nowhere else to go. So you you went through the tunnel because like Joe said, I'd never been here before. So I didn't know there was a left and there was a right, and that's how you got because it was a weird ground because you normally go into the ground and then sort of pan out. If you go in the cop, you walk in the cop and then you can walk wherever you want in the cop, but you couldn't do that there. You come out the turnstile and you're in your, the cage. You're, you're in that confinement. You had no idea that you'd walk around the back of the stand to get in the side bit. No, you're like, no on a clue. So everybody went through the tunnel um, and there was no one stopping you, no one saying anything. And as soon as that daylight come, for me, as soon as I seen the daylight, at first, it's a, it's a horrible thing for me to say, but I was made up because I was behind a goal. You know, I'm a 16 year old lad. And all I wanted to do was be right in the middle, jumping up and down crazy with all the lads, having a good time singing all the songs. My dad and my sister probably would have been preferred to be in the side. So in the cop, they used to go on the balcony and I used to go down the middle with my mates. That's just a thing for the lads, it was, isn't it? it? Like, you just want to be in amongst yeah, it all, it, don't it you? It was just normal. So I seen the goal and I was like, oh, happy days. Mm. You know, right? with all the lads here. And my dad's gone, go left, go left, go left. So we started to move a bit to the left. And what probably didn't realise with that, my dad didn't realise that you're in a pen. So like my dad's gone, oh fuck, getting out of here. So we'll go to the we'll go to the left and go to stand to the side with my sister. And obviously he couldn't. So he, he, he was trapped as well then because of that. And then um I just knew it, this is the bit when you just know about crowds, he just knew. And as soon as we got in, we, we were like, oh my god. And then uh, basically it's the bar, which yeah. was fucking thank God it didn't go in. Yeah. And um, basically at the bar and then come back out and we were in there and we were all like, oh my god. And to me, the way I describe it is everything just breathed and, and the crowd breathes and it moves in a certain momentum and it flows and all of a sudden it just breathed a little bit and there was just a gap in front of me and there was me and a bar in front there's the crash barrier in front of me and i was like i gotta get out of here this this is like my dad and my sister had gone like we just got split up so as soon as then obviously as it breathes and it eased I knew I was going to go flying at the bar then at like 100 mile an hour. So as I went flying into the bar, I just put my foot up and then just stood up. It's like the power of the crowd just made me stand up on top of the barrier. So I'm on the barrier then looking around sort of thinking, and you can see stuff that was going on, just like, holy shit, I need to get out of here. This is like carnage. But then trying to get people to move back and you were shouting, everyone was shouting, go back, but then no one was communicating because then no one could hear because the game's on and the game's going on and there's more people still coming in um, and literally all the lads around yeah because you can see you're the kids just going get out of here lads just go on go on, get walk over walk over so you literally the lads some of them who can move and stuff had their hands up and then you're just standing on their hands and literally I just went right down to the front got to the party and jumped over almost just crowd surfing on yeah, people just, just crowd surfing well virtually running just crowd surf down over the top of everybody and even then uh, you know, <laughs> even then it's not nice because obviously people were dying there then and um, you didn't really know. You, know you didn't know because it wasn't in your mind that you got a match and then someone was dying or it was really in pain in, in your head at 16 as well it, it was just we're at the game or there's too many people here all right i need to get out of here it's, it's a bit of a drama got to the front and jumped over and then I wouldn't say I was one of the first on the pitch but I was in the first group that was on the pitch the players were still on the pitch when I was on the behind the goal the match um, hadn't stopped at this point or no no the match hadn't stopped still was going on so it was early on so I think well, it stopped at six minutes past the it basically at the bar after about two and a half minutes or something 
So it was probably about five minutes or something like that. That I, I was on the pitch then. No idea what was going on with my dad and my sister. And then obviously, you're on the pitch then. You've just seen what you've just seen. And you've gone over the top. And then all you could do is the noise. Just the noise. Are you seeing people when you're kind of crowd surfing? Are you knowing that people are hurting at this point? At, at the time, you know they're hurting. You just don't think anticipated anyone was like in severe trouble. Mm. Um, you knew it was uncomfortable and it was, a, it was yeah. really bad but then it wasn't until I landed on the pitch I remember turning around and then there was people up against the fence and that was the bit that you knew you knew then you knew people were dying and it wasn't nice that bit then and there was a period then of like screaming at police screaming at stewards everyone was doing the same everyone was coming out there was people inside who were like shouting to open gates there was a side gate somewhere in a pen that someone was trying to open got to another point when there was just a load of lads went fuck this we're taking into our own hands we're literally on the cage and we were all ragging the cage trying to bend and when you see that there's a pictures when the pages are bent it was that was pure strength from loads of lads ripping it up literally just ripping the cage and as they're doing it Every now and again, a copper was coming over, like, what are you doing and all that? And everyone was telling him to fuck off and go away, or, or help at least, do something, join in. And then there was the odd copper he was. And that, you know, he, he, there was a lad with us, who, oh, all in all, he was a bald lad. Um, and he was on the fence with us and he was trying to rip it and everything. <clears throat> and, and he could see, but he was like one on his own out of whatever thousand of them were there who was with us. And then, um, it's funny what Joe just said because um, I've got a very similar sort of recollection in some ways about uh, not really remembering until I seen that. It's, it's bizarre what you just said. You, you showed me a bit there, mate. So I don't need to mean to. But I knew that was me immediately because that, I knew that was happened and I knew I had the kid on my shoulder and all that sort of stuff. I knew it was me. Um, but I, there's a bit of me in my mind that wasn't sure how we got there. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <coughs> and I'm not sure why I couldn't remember that clearly until we met it's and then when we met he was telling me and as he was telling me I was like oh yeah it did happen didn't it <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. and, and it's sort of it's just the brain isn't it now, when I um, when I woke up from my coma from two weeks two weeks in this coma the guy got blown up it was there he doesn't remember anything I, I remembered it all right. I thought I did one of the lads in Afghan then sent me a letter saying, you know, hope you guys are okay. This is what I remember from it. So I kind of had my memory of it, but then yeah. I read this letter of then what his memory was and it kind of, what you guys are saying, yeah. it, it, it it patched up the things that where my memory yeah, stopped and then that. Yeah. So yeah. it's weird, isn't it? How yeah, you, yeah. It, it, it was, a traumatic yeah, event can like, do that. And like I say, it was, um, it's that bizarre bit of what you just said. I, I, I've, i even when I told my statements to the police and I've gone through that, I know I've said things like, I'm not too sure how the kid got there, but I had a kid on my shoulders. That's been sort of like my statements. Mm -hmm. And then it was only when I saw that, I was like, all oh, right, okay. And then when we met, and I said to him, I said, listen, Joe, so before this goes any further, we need to have a bit of a conversation. He said, why? And when we sat in the bar having a pint, just the way you do things, isn't it? And <laughs> it's just like, I, I haven't got this unbelievably clear memory about that moment. Mm -hmm. And he went, I'm telling you how he did. I'm telling you now, and this is what happened, and I remember clearly, and then this, and I was like, look, I'm not, I'm not doubting you, but I just haven't got that memory mm -hmm. until you went through it, and then when he went through it, when people say, like, you have a cold shiver down your spine, and it really was, because all of a sudden, that whatever, years later, it was like, mm -hmm. shit, yeah, that did happen. Where does um, yours, Joe Pickle, from from when your legs started to hurt, and you kind of know? And yeah, so that was like when Beardsley at the bar, and then normally, mm -hmm. yeah, I thought I'd be three rows below you know fall over kind of thing because that would be tend to be what would happen on the cop you'd fall off the bar if we nearly scored or if you did score and then it was kind of well i'm not moving here and then as i say i got pulled pulled down the memory now i do remember is this hand coming in as i fell because it's run out of hands by the time you got to the bottom no one would move everyone's just you know either collapsing or they just they just they're like basically place. packed like that and um, so at that point, I know I fell into the crowd myself, which was just in front of the fence. But then I've just felt as quick as I fell in, I've kind of felt this hand, and these hands just pulled me through and pulled me over and out. So the first thing I remember seeing when I got out, there was a guy who didn't look in, in, in good shape uh, behind the goal on the floor, which you can probably see these kind of sort of... 
Oh, but others yes, large. He's, he's behind. They play. I think they'll blare him out here, but he's, he's that red there. There he yeah. is there. Mm. So I, I kind of yeah. remember seeing that guy there, and that that's when I started to panic them a little more than I, like I went. I, I wouldn't say I was panicking when I was getting pulled down because I'm. I'd had that happen before, and I knew from the cop this happens, and then somehow you end up back where you're meant to be. But when I seen that guy, and I, you know his body was kind of all twisted, and I thought he doesn't. He doesn't look right. He doesn't mm-hmm. look, and that's when I knew something serious was up. Obviously, then John's speaking to me. Who you with? Checking, having a look at me, making sure I'm all right. You're okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm okay. Who you with? I'm with my stepdad. Where is he? I don't know. I don't know where he is. So I'm looking just initially around the pitch to see if I can see if he's already on the pitch or whatnot. And I can't see him. So John's like, "Come on, we'll we'll find him." So he gets me on his shoulders, and you know he's reassuring me. Oh, it's mad this isn't it mate you know just talk trying to be like normal you know rather than making make me feel scared he's kind of oh, this will be all over in a minute it'll all be sorted don't worry that kind of thing just put me at ease really to make me feel okay and then i'm kind of looking and i'm looking and I'm like, there he is there so like i think we go in and in and out a couple of times and i eventually spot him but again like the way john said he, he kind of had to crowd safe people my stepdad's kind of doing the same thing and you can see he's stepping on people who, who clearly just aren't in a good place, do you know what I mean? But it's kind of like he's got nowhere else to go. It's not like he's trying to deliberately hate someone or hinder someone. It's kind of like, if I don't step on this guy's shoulder, I'm not getting to that next point. Like, so he's kind of had to do the same and he's trying to be as careful as he can. And then he's got over the fence. Someone pulled him over. Else. In fact, I think it was someone someone from inside pushed him over like to make sure he got over but that person was like they weren't doing too well either but they still managed to find it in them to sort of give him that extra nudge over obviously then John's took me over to him and he's kind of like you know is he alright yeah he's fine and they kind of exchange things and then John runs off to do you know a lot more after that um, which I'm sure he'll go into and at that point my stepdad was all about getting me as far away from that as he could so he's took me off to the centre of the pitch and I think at this point, this is when um, me mum kind of knew it was all right because the camera zooms in on me, um, the, the, the the match footage, and I think I think it might have been Des Lynam or Dickie Davis, one of them, and they go, oh, that little boy is okay, or something. They say something daft like that, but I don't know. I don't know if he's no. <laughs> I say it's a funny story, like, but it, it obviously it's not a funny situation. But the, I don't know if you know the strikers football pitches in Kirby, back of Kirby. No, no. There's a famous um, father side referee called Davy Crocky. Now Davy Crocky's like <laughs> he's the most obese man you've ever. <laughs> and the, the amount of times he got his head kicked in on these football pitches. <laughs> Well, you haven't got a clutch about yeah. it, no. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but my mum says all I ever, all what my mum's first, what my mum's first day uh, memories is of obviously what was going on at back at home was she said he must have been taping the match on VHS, mm. and she said I just remember seeing Davy Crocky running up the street and his pants were falling down and Paula was kept slacking <laughs> up and he's waving this VHS screaming in the street. <laughs> Joey's all right, Diane. Joey's all right. He he's no fixing way. himself. No. Do you know what I mean? So no that's like me mum. That's the memory my mum has of it. Like no he's, he's big Davy Crocky. Yeah. Um, running, running up the street with a VHS to show that he'd see me on, in case my mum missed it. Yeah. Kind of thing. Because obviously. Well, again, just, it goes back to the no social media, no phones. Yeah, it's yeah, like that's yeah, yeah. absolutely not. <laughs> that was the Facebook yeah, then. Davy exactly. Crocky runs. Davey Crocky, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> red card on his VHS. <laughs> But, um, so that was like one of her memories that she remembers like you know of it because obviously she must have been at panic stations at that point so, mate I can't imagine seeing something like like like, like that on yeah. like live and yeah. just because there's very few things you see of that of obviously that scale live mm. just must well, be the, absolutely the like it is from a from like a BBC point of view and all that I only you know patches because obviously we were there we, I, I, I wasn't watching it the game wasn't on so it's not like Sky today where every single game was on some of these games went on. I don't think that one was on TV. It was on TV then, no. It was on Grandstand because it was Saturday quarter past three. Right. Uh, three o'clock, sorry, Saturday three o'clock. So it's not, it's, again, it's different time. So, yeah, so yeah, yeah, I'm with you. It would have been on Match of the Day at night. And then when when you've seen, I've only seen the footage since, it's in like the, the Grandstand studio or Match of the Day studio. And they say, like, well, we've got to go to over to the ground now because mm. there's, an, there's an incident and stuff like that. I'm with you. But the game's not live, no. It's right. just a fluke of you being on camera as well. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. imagine if you wasn't, you would the fear oh, your yeah, mum would be in. Scary, frightening. But so we were on the centre pitch, and obviously the cameras picked us up there. But at that point, my stepdad's panicked. Then once he knows I'm all right, he's thinking about his brother and the mate that's in the ground still. 
So he took me up to the forest end and um, no sight of anyone medical or anything to look at you, nothing like that okay. at all. Just I just remember the ambulance, the ambulance that was right at the far corner at the forest end at the back. Yeah, So he took me towards that and he went, do you want me to take you over to the paramedics to see if they have a look at you? And I was like, no, I feel okay. So he took me, these forest fans shouted over and went, he's okay. They were on like the stand, start, the stand on the side. So they went, he asked some come and sit down. So they stood up and sat me down. Someone put a blanket over me, I don't know where the blanket came from. Because I remember saying, but yeah, it's boiling, why have I got a blanket on? And um, they gave me a drink and I just remember I was shaking drinking this drink and he was like, do you mind if I leave me lab with, with you for a minute because I've got to go and find my brother. Mm. So they were like, no, no, no. So to be fair, these two Forest fans, they looked after me while he then went off to see if he could find where his brother was. So, you know, obviously however long he was gone at that stage, I sat with them waiting for, you know, obviously for him to come back like, at that point. I think even that made fucking making me... I just imagine I'm being in somewhere with with my sister and my little girl at the same time, and having to leave you, my little girl, and then say, yeah. you know, listen, I'm gonna to need to go and find me. Just like mm. was, people are making, people are making heart wrenching decisions in like seconds. Whether it's you know standing on someone's shoulder and hopefully that they're okay and you want to help them, but you need to get out and you need to find your son or your brother. That's my dad did exactly what you're saying there, and my dad did. Um, and he has to live with this one. I uh, hope he doesn't mind me saying it was, um, he, had to ch- he had to make a choice. He had to make a choice between me and my sister, basically. So when we'd got in, it was like, when we'd got into the pen eventually, we were all that close. We were slowly getting moved apart. So he's he's here, and like we say, sister's in front of him, and I'm like two down, so he can see me and stuff. But there's that many people, like, I, like you know, hopefully no one ever does feels it, but, when I say about personal space, the best way I can describe it is, my dad described it, that his nose was in this fella's ear, that they were stood next to each other, and in between them was my sister, and um, she's only little, and um, basically she was, the best way I can describe it is she was drowning, because she was so little, she was suffocating, because the people were so bigger than her, they they were up, like my dad's nose in this fella's ear, and in between them is my sister, so she's got no oxygen, so between them all, they were trying to like wriggle and then get the, no one could move. So they're trying to somehow move her and then all the lads around were conscious of the fact that there was like my sister there and they were trying to somehow get her oxygen and get her air because she was suffocating. Um and but my dad had to make the choice of how do I stay with Kathy or or, or what do we do about John? Keep um, an eye on me lads, yeah. Um Fucking but I, I, you always made the right decision, like 100%, you know, it's, it's not nothing against him from that point. You made the right decision. I would have made exactly the same decision. I think he always knew I'd be all right, as in mm. the match before, in the middle with all the lads, all that sort of stuff, and you'd be used to a crowd a lot more than probably my sister was. So, he, th- it, but he had to do it. He had, that's the decision he had to make on the day. Um, I still can't get over that. your age, Joe, as well. Like, mm. my, my little girl, she's, she's seven this year. It's, it's fucking scary. Yeah. Mm. I think different time in the sense that like you can have the more streetwise yeah. obviously back then but yeah. still doesn't take the but fact no. that I was still only eight and yeah. you know if the worst case scenario I did pass away then I probably well, I would have been the youngest victim because I think it, Stephen's, Stephen's uh, cousin yeah. who was ten wasn't it ten yeah um, so I'd have been the youngest victim if I had have actually died at the at, you know I'm talking about you being young as well and you think that like you're old at sixteen yeah, it's mad well. isn't it. Mm. I was saying, um, I just thought you were a man. <laughs> you know what I mean? My yeah. head was just one of the half fellas has just pulled me out and sold me out there kind of thing. And even to know that he, when we met, that he was only a kid himself. It was. Was, was there any? Um, again, I'm obviously I, listen. I've grew up with the story. I go the match. I know everything. I'm just thinking from a from another point of view. Was there any? when you ended up being in the other end, what were the other away fans like? Were they thinking that you were causing trouble? Did they... No, no they, they knew. I mean, I think initially, because if you ever watch another footage, it's the booing at first, yeah, when the boo, fans yeah. first start spilling, and that's the obvious reaction, isn't it? You kind of think, you know, it's the, it was the 80s, obviously, Heisel was only a few years before and things like that. So I think it was probably the obvious reaction to, to, to see, but then it was very quick from my perspective, as, you know, as young as it was, that people wanted to help. Because yeah. people were like concerned when the, the, uh, we weren't the only two Liverpool fans that had gone towards the forest. Then no. obviously a lot of people had spilled that way, and you could see that there was you know forest fans shouting over, "Do you need anything? You're okay." And people were looking out and checking for you. Um, 
when we stepped out returned and we couldn't obviously couldn't find his brother and he'd spent a good bit of time trying to look for him it was maybe he's gone back to the car so let's go back to the car and hopefully you know we'll see him there so we got back to the car and no one's at the car and then this family again because you don't have a mobile phone you can't ring no one you can see people queuing outside phone boxes to try and ring going to say they're all right and this family invites us in and go do you want to come and ring ring home and let them know you're okay so I rang home and he went, do, do you want a drink? I'm okay, I'm okay. And he's like, no, I'm going to make you a cup of tea. And this is me, I'm from Kirby. He like to give me a cup with the sauce. And I was thinking, why have I got a plate with a cup? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, there's no, and there's no chemical butty on it. But that's it. Like that again. In my, that's Brilliant. what I remembered, you know what I mean? I'm like, fucking, fucking cup of sauce, what's that for? I want to do with this bit. You know? And it was like, and I, yeah, mum, I'm fine, I'm fine. I'm all right, I'm all right. You know what I mean? And then I just remember then my stepdad's brother going to the car and then he'd, he'd be like rock solid not, not a tear nothing and then the two of them just collapsed on the floor in the middle of this woman's garden like you know the two of them were just rolling around screaming crying and that's when I first cried really because I was upset but it sounds stupid I, at that point I was more upset because they were upset rather than oh god what have I just gone through mm. it was mm. more oh no they're crying so I started crying and there's something something strange I think of being a kid and seeing like Mm. And an adult cry. Yeah. I me, I oh, it just brings me back that exact moment you've described it brings me back to um and I suppose it's the innocence of a kid. The day after my, my mum was funeral, right, I remember I slept in my nan's and um I don't know, my dad had never cried, he's a proper old fella's fella, like old school kind of fella. I've never seen him cry. And the next morning after my mum's funeral, I uh, I woke up and he was he was crying his eyes out in the toilet. I could hear him crying. I can't remember sneaking downstairs, right, and going to my name, um, going to my nan. I was like, "Why is my dad crying?" And she was like, "You're gonna have to kind of look after him a bit yeah. now." And then that made me cry, like seeing him cry. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I was obviously upset. My mum had just died, but yeah. I don't know. There was something about being a kid and seeing an adult cry yeah. mm-hmm. and being really emotional and really. It, it, I think it's a protective yeah. element, isn't it? Because you think they're they your hero, they're the person who's gonna look yeah. after you and make sure you're all right. So to see them upset, it's kind of like, "Whoa, hang on a minute." But, yeah, that must have been that, that, strange feeling that, that. Weird, weird feeling like so obviously at that point then it was you know as we were all back together kind of thing and it was I, I can't remember anything about the GNO I just remember it being no radio no speaking nothing that's 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 it just dead silence you know for the for the trip back kind of thing that's uh, just surreal even, yeah, even that was, you just, oh. like, you've, that's one thing I think gets locked over those these little personal stories of how the fuck does everyone get home and what, what even yeah. what gets said on that way home yeah. what, what even yeah, mm. yeah. I, I don't remember a conversation or anything I feel like everyone was just in that status shock at that point yeah. by the, what's just gone on I remember the radio being on and um, it, it, it was the toll was just going up and up and up like hour after hour and then it was whatever 25 had died 30 had died and then you just couldn't get your head around it you know as in like you'd just seen it but then when you heard it on the radio that people were that people had died, even at that early time, like God knows what time we got back to the car, but it was it was on the radio and they were coming up with it. So the silence of your shock and everything, and then it, it was almost a reality of maybe in your mind you over compensated, thinking you know like, everyone will be alright, you know they're a bit hurt like and stuff, but yeah, everyone will be alright. Even some of the people that helped or saw, I was you just hoping. But then when you started to hear the people actually had died, then obviously that's when. But what did you do? What did you do, John? After after you've seen Joe and stuff, and you've seen him with his dad, what did you? Yeah, what happened so, with you? Um, uh, we took Joe, and then there was another kid knocking about um, as well. And th- there's a few reasons for this. Is one is um, he was only little, like he was a little nipper, so he was only a little wee man. So when I'd seen him and, and you got hold of him and stuff, I thought, well, where's, where can his parents or whatever see him? I thought with well, the goal, like you've got to be behind the goal because everyone's looking at the goal. And I thought they're never going to see him now. You know, he's tiny, so that's why I put him on my shoulders as well to sort of say he's here and he's safe. And it was an obvious place to stand. And then um, they sorted Joe out, and he'd gone. And then literally, you know, you're all right and everything. And then he's like, your stepdad and everything's okay. Yeah, yeah. And he's just like, thanks, mate. He's like, yeah, see you later, because you you just knew. I said before, you know, I've been in the cadets and done all these different things when I was a kid and you knew something was wrong. So after that, there was another kid knocking about. He was a bit older. They managed to sort of get old and ask him the same questions, who you were, who you are about. 
um, making sure he was safe. But literally within, I don't know, a couple of minutes, someone turned up and climbed in. And then there's a period when um, you sort of turn around and then there's people giving CPR. All the, sorry, I'm going to clarify that. There's all Liverpool fans giving people CPR and, and, and making sure, looking after each other. And then there was a lad just said to me, can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me, mate? And um, I said, what? He said, there's a rumour that there's ambulances down your friend. Can you can you help me carry him? I went, yeah, of course I can. So I, I picked him up. He picked him up and the pair of us had him like running down the pitch. Um, and at that point then, the police had formed a cordon across the middle of the pitch. So there was a good, I don't know how many people it takes to fill a whole pitch, but sideways, but you know, a good 150 of them right across the middle of the pitch. You all could have been helping and they never, <coughs> um, <coughs> and they were all joined by arms. So it was What was case. the reason for that? The, the trouble, they thought it was going to be trouble. They thought it was, like they thought it was Liverpool fans spilling on, a, spilling on a pitch and they didn't want him to get to the Forest fans. So as Joe said, a few of them were booing and stuff like that. Surely they could <coughs> fucking see that. No, do you know what? I, I, let me just, I'll, I'll finish with another sentence. So they were booing and stuff and they, they didn't really know and then we then kept on running and I remember screaming at the busies to move and uh, and there was no way we were stopping like and so we just basically straight through the line and just carried on running with this lad and we had him and we put him in the corner and as soon as that's when the forest fans then could see that there was bodies being pulled out and put in this corner because there was an ambulance there that, that they just went quiet just straight, yeah. I remember then we put this lad down and his mate stayed with him and I was, you know, do you need anything or anything like that? And he was like, no, 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 I've got him now, thanks, mate, and all that. And I remember then just being completely emotional of just starting to fall to bits then. And I remember sort of running up to by the forest fans and standing on a fence and just, like, screaming, there's any doctors here, anyone can help us? We'd like, we need help, we need help. And then it was sort of going quiet. And then, like Joe said, they, so they, they changed really quickly to be absolutely, completely fair. And then the forest fans were then coming to the front and like climbing over the fence and stuff and saying, yeah, yeah, I can do this, I can do that, whatever. But at that point then I'd come back down because I was like, there's just too many people. So we come back down the pitch again. And then um, we carried the board back, so we carried an advertising board back. And there was some lads putting some other fellas in the corner and stuff. And then again, the lads on these boards were like, listen lads, we don't stop. Then busy's aren't stopping. It's like, we've got to get these boards through. But they're still not helping. Still not helping, no one's helping. So we were flying through this line with these boards. What are the police I, saying as you run past? Know, I, I can't get my head round how they can't figure. Like they can't. You carrying you, bodies. You carrying, carrying and bodies. you can't fucking see. Like how I don't. I can't. Like I, I think it's a hard one, and you, you're gonna get. You, I'll bring you in on this one. And they've been told not to do anything. So at what point do you break your um, order not to help? But when you can see people dying morally. Surely at that point, that's when you go, fuck this, I'm sorry, yeah. son. Like, we're all first day trained, every single one of them is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they all could have been doing something, and they all did nothing. I'm sorry, a very small minority did something. Yeah, yeah. And um, we carried the board back, we got another couple of lads on the board, and we took them back down again, and we did two or three different trips with different fellas, because we, we someone had just said there was ambulances coming. Um, there wasn't. <laughs> no one knew that. Um, and eventually, after about four or five trips. I remember there was sort of bodies around us and um, and I knew how to do CPR and stuff like that. And we started working on this lad. And as we started working on this lad out of nowhere, my dad grabbed me. Um, and my dad had found me, grabbed me, and then there was another fella start working on this lad. And um, I just had it in my head that, you know, I'm all right, dad, you know, I'm all right. These people need help sort of thing. And he was like, John, there's no way in hell I'm leaving you. You're coming with me, come on. And uh, he just sort of dragged me back and then dragged me back into the stand where my sister sat on the step. Um, and I, I didn't think anything about sort of their side of the story because, you know, they, they've gone through something as well. I wasn't close to because I wasn't with them. So then, but he didn't know what, they didn't know what I'd done either or, or what you'd seen or what it's been about, especially at that, at that moment. So I remember just sitting on a step and I said, again, when the bizarre things happen, I'd done all this, one of my shoes had fell off, uh, brand new Reebok Classics, and I was gutted. You know, when you, when you come back down and sit down, you go, oh, no, where's them gone now? <laughs> and, and, I'm, and I'm sat on his step going, I can't believe this. And I swear to God, as I'm sat here, I'd look round like that, and there's my shoe, like literally, like, you know, 10 metres away. And I was like, fucking hell, look, he's there. Walking around, put my shoe back on and all this. 
So there's rows of photographs of me running up and down the pitch and stuff, and you've got like one foot, like right, again, you know, one saying it on, mm. socks on the other foot, and that sort of thing. Um, and I remember sitting back down, like you said before about these little memory things. I had a Twix in my pocket, uh, and it all melted, and again, gutted. And you're like, oh, I can't believe that. I was really looking forward to that. And I was sat there with this Twix, and it was all melted, and for some reason, I'm eating it. And then my dad, obviously, because then he's sort of looking, and he can see what's going on more than he recognised it more, was then, like, you're all right and stuff. And obviously, we were like, yeah, fine. You know, all right, yeah. You know, just, yeah, okay. He's like, well, we need to leave. You know, we need to get out of here because he didn't want us to see what was going on. Um, and they hadn't opened the gates yet at all. You couldn't get out the normal so way that you could. probably, I reckon, at this point now, for them to leave, this is about four o'clock now. This is like, I was on the pitch for about 45 minutes and my dad couldn't, my dad couldn't do nothing because he was stuck in the stand, stuck in the pen with my sister and all the people around him. And apparently he said at one point he could see me but like, and they were all shouting, so my dad's shouting, like, but he couldn't get to me because obviously in front and all the, where the, where the pen was, was, was people and they were all dying. So my dad was like, look, I can see, our God, I know he's okay. Um, I'm not going down there until I'm not standing on people or anything. I'm just going to leave them and, and the medics, people, sorry, the, the Liverpool fans look after them and see how they get on. So he's just stayed with my sister, like from a security point of view, to make sure she was okay. But when he see me and they've all started shouting and everything, all the lads around were shouting and everything, but I couldn't hear them. Like, my hearing's crap. And I couldn't hear them. And then um, it was come. that like half an hour later when he's clocked me again and gone, right, no, there was a path, he said, and he's just gone, I'm, get, I'm getting him now. Like, that's it. But you come. can't even imagine, can you, the confusion of just like, obviously, you know, where, no. uh, just, you know, you've been to a fezzy and you see your mate and you shout and it, it's, yeah, and it's just a normal, nice, chilled fezzy. It's, it's impossible to get someone's yeah, attention yeah. to get a message, is no. it? When, yeah. Whether you're saying to you know go back or stop or you, yeah, it's fucking impossible, yeah, isn't it? There the, 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 like you can't communicate at that point. Like the the person next to you, you can speak to, but then the someone within the distance, there's no chance. There's absolutely no chance. And and know, even so, like the sorry, to interrupt, no, even okay. like the the I've been to festival before, and like there's there's a point where you mentioned both, you know. Does that you think this is getting a bit much now? And then you, th- you I mean, I've obviously can't imagine what it's like, but even I felt it myself with a crowd, and you think, fucking hell, this is a bit like you start to get a little bit. And then you when only you have st- that confidence, of, like you say, which you used to have, is if the stewards or there's yeah, 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 who were, were, you, who were on your side, yeah. or yeah. you've got that, but that there is that fear of suddenly like you can, I can feel it that sweatiness where you think something's going a little bit like. Pete Tong here or there's just a little bit too much people walking through here and I can't imagine what that must feel like when you when you know it's gone completely <laughs> fucking out of control yeah, how, how long? or anything else and then that's the bit when later on we'll get to it like in your statements and your stories and all these sort of things you know that's when uh, it'll come out when you speak later but there's some really, really dodgy things happened to do this, and, and I know everybody knows that. But I know loads personally about my statements and stuff like that. And the half of that is some of these stories that they were or afterwards were saying things like to you. So like I, I'd said it genuinely as it was. I remember there was a copper next to me. He was bald, I mean proper Kojak bald, like, and he was at the fence with me, stood next to me, ripping his fence for about an hour. They questioned me about him, as in like, how, how fantastic was he then? You know, he was brilliant, wasn't he helping you out? Yeah, he was one among, one amongst whatever thousand. And at the same time, the only people were were Liverpool fans. And we were all trying to save him, but he was just doing his bit like everybody else was. He really helped and fantastic for him for doing that. But at the same time, there was no fact. Yeah, but tell me about him, what he did again and how fantastic that was. Know. And it was overemphasising how amazing it was. And then the other one is Joe. Um, they they wrote that a policewoman gave him to me. Um, the uh, policewoman came up and handed me Joe and then asked me to look after him and um, and, and make sure he was going to be okay um, and that's in the statement fucking hell <laughs> that's like, as I sit here that's I in the statement um, still in the statement it's not now after no. the in- inquest and stuff but it was fucking and the scary hell. thing is and the scary thing is it's my handwriting and um, I didn't write it <laughs> I, I didn't like it, I, and, but that's well, the story. Yeah, it was, was only... It about, was it sort of about your, sister, or your sister's name? And yeah, the, and Kenny Daglish there's, well there's four things, there's four things. Um, so, my sister's name's Kathy, 
Catherine, um, spelled it with a K. Uh, and in the statement, I'd written in my handwriting, uh, it was a C. I don't know how to spell my sister's name. Like, I wouldn't have spelled my sister's name on it. That's one. Uh, Kenny Dalglish, like, obviously, you're talking to two mad Liverpool fans. I know how to spell Kenny Dalglish, right? And in it, in my statement, for whatever reason, I think at some point I've seen him or something at the match or something. And, uh, as in, uh, on the day, and I'd mentioned his name and then I'd written his name down in a statement and it was spelt with a D-L-G-H-I-S-H so it was an extra H after the G I don't know how to spell Kenny's at least like um, there was the one that, and then the last one was uh, in my statement it, again it said um, I, I told you before about the woman my dad was married to I had no feelings for her whatsoever and in the statement it says it's something about I came home and told my mother I like not for one ounce of my life what I call my mother so in the statement it was those four things and all of them were in when I'd seen them again it was only like whatever number of years ago like five years ago whatever after the the inquest started that they brought you your statements because you hadn't seen them since I was well 16 and a half because we gave evidence to West Midlands police within a few months or whatever it was and he came to the house even that comes to the house interviewed me on my own no mum and dad no dad dad wasn't allowed in the same room all that um, I was under 18 and then they're questioning you and I've seen it, it was a question, it was a question and it wasn't give you a statement. Yeah, of course. And then yeah. like I say, guiding you down a path of how great this copy mm. was and all that sort of stuff. And even though, even though then you wrote it and, and went through it. Because they knew at that time we need to get, we need something, something positive fucking sure. And then when I saw the writing and it was like, is that, are these your signatures and is, is this you done? Yeah, yeah. But I didn't write that. I didn't like that, and I didn't like that, and I didn't like that. And then the lad in the inquest, I went, right, okay, well, let's go through it and you know, give your oh, version of me. Four things like that. Four I things. didn't realise the scale, like, Jesus. Yeah, and, and like, like the say, scale, yeah. yeah. Some of the things you can sort of go, oh, you know, I forgot about on the day and all that. I know how to spell, I know how to spell my sister's name. And, and more than that, I know how to spell Kenny Dalglish. <laughs> 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 but it was just things like that. So they're four for me. And my evidence, um, I, I didn't get called to give evidence. They, my dad didn't want me to because he thought I'd gone through too much. But my dad went to give evidence in the first um, in the first trials and stuff. Um, but he, he didn't want me to. But then the prosecution thought that there wasn't there wasn't enough in some of my statements, so then they weren't used. Um, but so yeah, four four obvious areas. And you were interviewed like two days, two, so it was, was it? A couple of months. Co couple oh, wait, sorry, sorry, a couple, couple of months, months after, yeah. after it. A couple of months. Right. And then South Yorkshire, was it South Yorkshire? West Midlands. West Midlands. West right. Midlands came to the house. But not South Yorkshire? No, South no. Yorkshire, I mean, no, West Midlands come to the house. West Midlands were the like independent that came to do it. And like you say, I was upstairs in a, like a, a bedroom and a copper come in there, I think it was two of them. And they questioned you, questioned you. It wasn't, hey, how can we help you about your events and what happened in a day? Again, you know, I was under 18. I should have had someone with me. But yeah, again, with you, yeah, yeah. All these things to light, and, yeah. and obviously all these things happened. My dad's in another room and my sister was in another, also giving that evidence. You know, um, to go back just after the, after the event, you know, you get back that night and stuff. That night and the next coming days, I mean, you 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 already know at that point you've been through the car journey home. You said you said, you know you've been through something something bad's happened. What are those next couple of days like? You know, with the, coming back to Liverpool and you're thinking, wow, this is fucking, this is big. Mm -hmm. You know, what's happened is wrong, and it's yeah. I mean, to me, it was like you know, like John said, he went, he was doing his exams a few weeks later, so it was me back on the playground on on the Monday. But again, no like checking, you're all right. No like. No, this isn't a, a blaming the school for anything because yeah. it's just a different it's a different world now, isn't it, compared to then? And mm. now you would have been put into counselling straight away instantly. That would have been just the first thing. But I remember to have things like even just having a game of footy at break and then being scared if someone got too close to me and being panicky at that and then going, oh, I don't want to play football today. I'm kind of all right, and I kind of went into a, a bit of a shell. Um, that's when the flashbacks start. That's when you start thinking about the people you've seen laying down. Who were, were the right colour and you know obviously that person's probably dead or and then you start having horrible dreams and you know things like that so that's kind of where it went for me for a number of weeks after it um but again you know 
even if you you know my mum she, she doesn't know where to take it other than to the GP and then the GP doesn't know what to do with you because there's no counselling services there's no trauma things or anything like that set up at that point in the 80s and it was kind of just trying roll your sleeves up and just get on with it kind of thing you're a kid you're resilient you'll bounce back you'll be all right you're only little and, mm. and, and kind of that's that's kind of what no one no one had an attitude everyone was very concerned family wise and mm. even me like me mates like were like oh god what was it like and they just want to they just want to know everything about it rather than like tips on just around, typical though. kids like you know oh, what, what happened and, you know but then they, they say something tough, like it, it was your coach to bruce grobbler when you were on the pitch you know, yeah that, so that just shows the age that yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that's the kind of question you make with that yeah rather than you're know, all right yeah he gets a hug <laughs> it'd be more was brucey grobbler next to you like was you able to open up to your your mum and family in that oh, way yeah, yeah, yeah of course yeah you know she made sure that she was constantly on me you know you know okay checking on me things like that so you were just relied on your family to, to sponge off to cuts, kind of like yeah. get yourself through it. And then obviously they opened up the ground and then I remember writing a little poem and taking that to put on the pitch with like a teddy and stuff and walking around the cop and putting my scarf on where I would normally sit on the bar and, you know, little, little things like that that I kind of remember about it as well. But it was, it's just not gone away. And I think that's why, I, I don't know about John, but I find it therapeutic to talk about it. I, can't I, I feel a little bit yeah. better every time I talk about it. And that's not because I want to keep dragging it up and stuff. And I know, like, everything's panned out the way it has. And we're all trying to slowly move on. You know, God knows how the families ever will. And I think a lot of them n- never will. But I always find it easier and better if I just get a bit of release from it sometimes. And just, mm-hmm. just, just speak about it sometimes. Because it's fucking horrible. How are you... You say you find it easy, I find it fucking... I, I don't mean to be rude, but I, I'm fine as I'm looking at you and if I zone in too much and concentrate too much on the story, I start fucking well enough. Mm. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's, um, I, I agree with what you said. It's, um, I, I think at the time, it, um, I, I was uh, we came back and then I went to my nan's because uh, my nan was my world and we went, we went to my nan's and um, uh, we, we stayed the night in my nan's and then on a the Sunday you woke up and then there was, a, there was an Echo special and um, I, I was in that, you know, you carrying bodies and all that. And I think that was the first time in Nan then had gone, holy shit, like, you all right and everything. Um, but it, the house was a weird house for me to live in. And um, I mentioned it before, you know, it, it wasn't a nice home for me and, and when I was a kid. And um, I went back to a, another environment, which which wasn't a great place to be. Um, <clears throat> so I didn't really have anyone to speak to. And... Um, there was a lot going on then with your exams uh, and I think not that I've got a grudge about it but it's definitely affected my life pattern when you've got the sliding doors moment that was obviously a sliding doors moment don't get me wrong I survived and I'm grateful for that but the knock-on effects of what happened after I think have driven different things in my life and hopefully where I've ended up then that's all positive but then when you look back at some things that happened in the interim period you know I've got a few a lot of regrets about some of those things like uh, I was just uh, as in you never had the support when you got back and I, stuff. I think I think it could have been so much different, yeah, because it wasn't there. Um, you know, but first of all, I, I lived in Wales, so it's like little things. I remember on the, on the news there was something about um, uh, any kids in Liverpool who'd been to Hillsborough and he was sitting there exams got like a leniency and stuff like that. Because you can get a leniency now for an extra two hours if you you want a bit more time reading. You know, two weeks before you'd been involved in something, and I got like absolutely nothing. I'm not saying you should have, but you know, at the same time, it's no one said anything to you. So I sat in exams for two weeks later, and I was a A student, and I ended up with uh, four Bs and five Cs. And at the time, you can say, "Oh, that's great," but at the time, it wasn't for me because I should have got all A's, um, and it wasn't. And um, that period then of so the April to the August is just like a blur to me, an absolute blur that, you know, no counts, no no conversations. Are it's, you able to speak to, like Joe said, there's a mum was there, was, you, was your dad and stuff, were you able to open um, up? And um, No, me and my dad got a bit of a funny relationship, so that that's hard sometimes. Um, and, but also he was going through a lot as well, you know, he's going through course, a lot. Yeah. He's, he, he's, he's, he's been through it and then he's got two kids who are going through it. He, he wanted to be there for you, but at the same time, the house was very much... Uh, well, you'd be all right, you know, you'd be all right, crack on sort of thing. And and I think it's only when you get a little bit older and you consider, I've got four children now, and you consider my children, and Joe's got twins, and you look at them and go, oh my God, you know, that, that never happened. Mm-hmm. But yeah. it was a different time, different yeah. sort of 
um, environment. There was no support network. So for them, for quite a few months, and I know I sort of changed a lot from that. I, I just turned off anything academic then, and I've never been in, interested in anything since. I don't know why, just not interested in it. Even though you were an A, you were an A student, yeah. yeah. I, I did A levels and wasted two years and come out of that. Literally, hardly ever went to any exams or lessons, and got ended up with a couple of a couple of A levels in geography and stuff. But they're like D's, but um. I just wasn't interested. This is just not interested at all. Just didn't sit well with me. And went on a different path. The path turned out all right. But at the same time, that when you look at that support, then that, that just wasn't there. And and that's the difficult one. It really yeah. is a struggle with that sometimes because it was different times and it was different this. But I was a 16 year old lad. Like you say, I was just a kid. And I was a kid and like, Joe's circumstances are different because he was smaller, even though he's been affected. I was older and a little bit more mature, probably not much, but a little bit older, a little bit more <laughs> yeah. mature. And and you've seen it and understood what's going on. And you're straight back in school on a Monday and set your exams soon, Claire. Cheers, there's, some, there's some psychology and I always look at me and my sisters. It's it's really interesting. So I was 12 on my mum passed. I had one sister who was six and one sister who was four. Oh no, sorry, one sister who was seven and one sister who was five. And it's different in seeing us as people. Right compared to how long we had with, with my mum if you like so yeah. my mum was a real mum like you know I was a real mummy's boy so I yeah I'm a little bit half the half I'm I had my dad there but I grew up with my dad for my teenage years so I grew up with hardens but I was got that emotional side with my mum my middle sister who had a lot of my mum is so emotional like you know she goes to the supermarket and before she leaves she'll tell you that she loves you I love you Tara my younger sister who only had four or five years with my mum wouldn't give you a fucking kick off the side you know what I mean <laughs> yeah. she's, she's only had me dad yeah so it, you can see like the, the impact the difference yeah. it's, like, it's weird you're saying yeah. that because I've got that with my like I've got two half brothers so my dad died when I was 11 so my youngest brother he doesn't remember him so it's kind of mm. he's like similar like that but then my middle brother who's like only a couple of years younger than me he, he's, he's had a bad time you know what I mean mm. with, with dealing with what happened with my dad and he still does now even though you know he's 38, 39 now, but he's still quite impacted by that because obviously he was living with him. I wasn't because he, uh, you know, he's my half brother. He met yeah. someone else and they, they came with that, that relationship. But it's, it's weird how you say that. It's yeah, that, that well, it's just the mentality, that psychology. You mm, see it like it's the it's ages, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is tough. That. Yeah. Did you have anything like Joe mentioned before, but in the playground and people coming close to you did you have that any of that sort of like fear of crowds or that that busyness that you know um, even shopping centers i can imagine might be quite do you, do you know what in, in a different way um and a different way now if, if anyone ever goes to like a, a festival anything with me they always follow me because i guess the bar fastest i can get out of there fastest you just you know the crowd you can work the crowd and you're just in and out and you can move it hasn't really bothered me until we've had uh, I've had my own children and we've been in a couple of circumstances a couple of times when I've felt myself starting to lose control as in emotionally mm. because you can just feel it when I was younger no not really I didn't because I went I went about the match you know and I got a couple of mates who never I was going to ask game. that you know how what yeah. was going on that because Th that's what mean? happened with me we stepped out just in his head it was I think his way again it was he wants to be around all the fans again and just yeah. be back in it so we were at the match I think it was Everton wasn't it it was Nil yeah, Nil was Army game, we yeah. were at that game we went to the cup fight he, he went to the the replay when it got played but I, I didn't go to that no I didn't go to um, that at Old Trafford wasn't it yeah. and then we had the final and I don't know fucking clue but my mum ended up with a ticket as well so she ended up at Wembley with us as well and it's funny because like on, on the Wembley footage when you see the game everyone was sat up the side of the pitch yeah they took the fences down out, they took the fences down and they were letting people sit on the sandbank so we were right behind one of the side stands and we stepped out made a point to make sure we had seated tickets because obviously he was a bit panicky and a bit worried about that but, but you can see me mum on the telly watching the match like this. Like, you know, like that, like, just before Everton scored, it was in the last minute as well. And you can see me mum, so I don't know if yeah. she ended up with a ticket, but she ended up coming with us anyway to the game. And that was her, obviously, protective nature of sort of, yeah. you're not going there again, you yeah. know, after this, this because that's only a month later, you know what I mean? I, so. I think it was the belonging, yeah. because we were like and, and we still are now but as a kid football mental like everything was about Liverpool yeah. everything lived it breathed it 
I took every single paper cutting out the echo on any single Liverpool player, cut that out, glued it into something. I've got about seven or eight of these binders that are all this big. You go through them and you read all the stories and everything mm-hmm. from like years before. Mental about Liverpool. So it was like a belonging and, and you were desperate yeah. almost to get back and then desperate to be amongst it because you were like, these are my people and you know we've been through this together. Um, it's funny how better. people kind of have that attitude of, you know, Right, let's just get back straight away into it. And then other people have said, I can't. I can't, I can't yeah, go yeah. Back. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've got a couple, I know a couple of lads who, who basically, one after one, a completely different one, completely different example. After Istanbul, basically said, I'm never going again. It's never going to get better than that. It's, it's never, <laughs> ever going to get better than that. And yeah. like, I didn't have quite the same opinion with the same sort of fortune. But at the same time, it was just going to get back into it. But I know a few lads who never went back. Yeah, mm, you can right. see why. You, uh, you know, I don't want to compare it to anything, but like you know, when people are ever involved in plane crashes, and obviously they don't want to go anywhere near aeroplanes, or you know, that sort of like yeah. just relationship to to what happened. It can, people yeah. just forget there's a lot of other victims because obviously a lot of people committed suicide after Hillsborough as it a result is, yeah. of it. So that you know, I know 96 people died on that day, but there has been other people who've died since as a result of what they experienced that day isn't it so and, and keep so. going with that there's, there's people with mental illnesses oh, yeah. there's people I'm sure if you looked into it we've got things that you could classify as whatever that has happened to you that you've never had any medical yeah. sort of official thing but you probably have yeah. and and we just don't know mm. we don't realise you know because no one's ever come to you to have that conversation but there's thousands of people who were there on the day doing just as much as what me and Joe were doing and more um, and, and even actively involved more that have got horrible stories to tell and they live with it yeah, I, I, I hope my best mate doesn't mind me saying it but like his uncle he used to go to match go everywhere and he was at Hillsborough and, and now he, he, he doesn't venture away from the lobster and crocky now not far from where he lives That's he kind of won't go anywhere or he, you know he's kind of stays at home and it's all stems back and knocks back to that and yeah. it's obviously that's really? how deeply it's affected his mental health over the years like yeah you know it's, uh, it's, it's what, what, what was it what was it like it sounds like a stupid question here but what was it like in the city following those days was it you know everyone coming together and it was just obviously the yeah. news I was... think when they opened the ground wasn't it when yeah. they opened the stadium and it was just like like the queues I just remember I think we stood in the queue I reckon for a couple of hours, hours at least hours, yeah. at least really? to go in yeah. to just yeah. like pay your respects and you know and then that scene of white wasn't it with the flowers red and white everywhere and the scarves and stuff and it was just it was it was just a togetherness what you see was people crying and hugging and you know people who didn't know people just hugging each other and it, it, it I don't think you'd get that anywhere else and I, and, mm. and I know like 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 what you were saying before we started about like when you were in the forces about we're Liverpool we're scouts we're, we're not English we're this kind of thing but we have got this tribal mentality but it, we do come together at the the most difficult times as a city mm. I just think it's unbelievable like you mm. know and the city you know for me during that time from what I remember it was it was immense like the, 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 I remember the mass gathering. we were outside for hours queuing to get in because again you, you just knew you had to you, know, you had to I mean I lived in Rock Ferry so you know we're from over the water and then we come over and we queued up for hours and then it's things that stick in your mind that you've never forgot um, John Paul Gale there was I don't want to call it graffiti but someone had wrote on the walls about you know, rest in peace, John, and all this, and he never lost it. Adam Spear, it was the other one, he was 14, he was from Runcorn, and you find these things out later in life, but those things had stuck with me mm. from day one, literally from standing in the ground. I've never met him, mm. don't know any of them, don't know any of the families or anything like that, it's just the names were just there. And then when we got in the ground, um, I, I remember that's the first time I, I know I, I felt a bit. That was the first time I really, really got completely just over emotional with everything and then we went to the balcony because that's where we used to stand in the car you used to come in and walk around back on yourself and there was just a bit on called the balcony that overlooked the entrance where it was a bit a bit safer in some ways for my sister and my dad and that's where we used to go and then we used to stand there and then i used to get off and go in the middle and come back and meet before the end and that sort of stuff and um, but we went there and went as soon as you stood in your spot that's when pff, it was all everything went then and it was just because you were home basically mm. emotionally you were connected and there was obviously the flowers and everything was going on as well and I think that was probably the first time and it was a good couple of weeks later that I knew I, I properly broke down uh, and obviously there was something not quite right but then that feeling then sort of passes because then you sort of take a big breath of air and go right <laughs> you know that's that done then like, next day back to real life yeah back to real life and it 
but yeah, it was weird. But then I got slightly different experiences to Joe because you know I was I was living in Wales and North Wales, and um, we didn't we didn't really have that you know in any way. It was like a city coming together. We were in my nans every week, so you know that's different now. And then my dad lives up in Crosby now, so we didn't have that connection back into the city at the time. So we were desperate as much as possible to come over here because mm. we could feel it, and yeah. you know it, it was something that really made you feel better. It really did. Yeah. Mm. With regards to the, the togetherness and that, what was it like then? That feeling of coming together, but then obviously the how things played out in the media and, and, and the government. I mean, that togetherness of all you know all being there for each other. How did that then? I mean, obviously that bit continued, but how does the feeling then change? For me, from being a kid, obviously, and being quite young at the time, the only thing, one of the things that sticks out with me is just how the adults that I was going to game with, and the ones who obviously experienced them were that else, but it was how, like, they had a guilt, they were carrying a guilt, as if, like, because of the media portrayal and the way it was made out that it, it was all Liverpool, it was all Liverpool, it was all Liverpool. It was people who were buying into that and going, fucking hell, did we do something wrong? Was it us? Yeah. You know, and when they're in that initial shock phase, it was kind of like, Fucking hell, mate, what, what, what did we do wrong? And, and that questioning of it. Mm. And it, that was obviously because of the fact the media rammed it down everybody's throats that it was, a, you know, a blame thing. And so, unfortunately, still today, you still see it now in certain aspects of life. Someone hears your accent and you mm. do get that still. I've heard it throughout my adult life going on holidays of someone sitting at the fucking sun lounge with a copy of the sun and I'll just go and throw it in the pool and they'll be like, it was all your own fault anyway, you know. Yeah. I've had that kind of thing said to me and shit like that over the years, so I can only imagine what it was like, even John's age, because he was more mature and older, onwards, what that must have felt like. I think it was a weird one because um, I think that's got two different effects. The one that Joe just talked to you there, I think, is really important, and that you, you then started to really doubt yourself, you know, as in, did I do enough? And, well, we went there late, we got there on time, we were there at like quarter past two, we went late. We didn't bump the gate. No one did that. We've got my ticket. You know, and then you're going through all these things and then obviously even inside and other fans have said it and sing the songs and stuff like that. You know, ugh. Joe mentioned it before. It's, it's really horrible when you talk about when you're getting out. You, just, you only realise afterwards you, you, you're probably standing on dead bodies or, or whatever's going on underneath you. And you didn't know that um, at the time. But then because it's carried on going and going like that you do start to feel like that as a like, shit was it me you know did, did I contribute in any way to that you and that's what that's one side and then the other side you know years later and we've got loads of examples I'm sure between us you know I've had it was maybe three or four years later we were doing some the cadets and we were down in HMS Heron in the Oval in the airbase and we were doing some bits down there and there's loads of lads from Coventry and they were almost laughing and you know, they were laughing at it and how it was useful and you did this and jokes and you know that sort of stuff because all they knew to be fair if I'm kind of balanced view was the view that was in the media so the media mm. thing was double edged it was not only hating Liverpool and Liverpool fans but it was also telling a story that everybody believed so the years and years and years to win that back and it's still not back you know, right, it's mm. still, still back is, is, and they did, they did that you know they did mm. that how they sleep at night and I just don't know because it's just been a terrible terrible journey for the families and everyone well, else involved and, well, and it's all their fault they did that you know it was premeditated they knew what they were doing they knew what they were doing and and, and that bit is you know you, it's so hard to live with in a in a world now that's got everything to do with the media how you can believe at a time they could get away with something like that you'd all sit in and laugh if it was in like um, Islamabad and oh yeah they're corrupt over there aren't they you've got that mentality oh they're horrible mm. aren't they because because that's what the media can do there hang on a minute we've got a regulated media in this country run by the government with legal laws and stuff it's not funny when it happens here um, and it does consistently and it's and it's never stopped you know it's they're doing it to today I just think of like when you say about the media there and you think of me you think of move it on to you know we had um, a guy last week who was at the MEM bombing got blown up yeah. and you're just trying to I'm just trying to think of something similar where you can compare it and you think that the media then span that 
suicide bomber and said that you know Manchester you know, you know the, the the people who were there weren't helping the kid you know just I yeah. can't fathom how I can't even fathom how people would it how the media would take that and then what did they get it from the police and then did they decide that that like I yeah. just can't get my head around look at Grenfell look at Grenfell yeah, exactly yeah. the same thing you know I've seen, I seen a tweet today funnily enough and it said apparently you know the, the girl who was um I don't know what it was. It was some sort of something that's gone on with the police recently. It might have been the the new police reform act or something. Anyway, there's been a big inquiry going on. Two weeks it's done. Two weeks from start to finish. Title: hundreds of hours of video, you know, statements, witnesses, all this done, and they've come to a conclusion that the, the police have done no wrong or something. But it took two weeks. The point of it, yeah, two fucking weeks <laughs> to do it because it's the it's the government and the police. It took two fucking weeks. Yeah, uh, you know, look at look at Hillsborough. You know, yeah, look at fucking all the other corrupt fucking things that have gone on how many years it takes yeah, yeah. and it it probably would take a couple of weeks if no one you know cared but the fact that they've you know it's Liverpool yeah. and people are thinking hang on this isn't right they come after us for those reasons you know they come after us because it was Liverpool and then even when you go through um, uh, the people that died I think it's actually only something like a third of the people died who were from Liverpool the other two thirds were either Merseyside or further afield and it's something like that in the numbers um, but then they've come after Liverpool and then they've continued to do it and it was football so at the time that's what Maggie wants is she hated it and they've gone after it and then there's been a doubt where someone somewhere has had a conversation to your point somebody somewhere has had a conversation at some point and said well this is what we need to do then because mm. you can't it doesn't just get on a steamroller on its own yeah, yeah, yeah. someone in the room on his own just doesn't go oh we can fix this and this is how we're going to do yeah, it yeah just blame it on the Someone's, yeah. someone at some point has to have a conversation that said this is the plan and this is what we're going to do you all stick to it and they have but with regard before I, I just want to go into it before I do I kind of ask you about your personal lives now that, that battle that's kind of then raged then you know ever since with regards to almost getting Liverpool's name back as fans and as a city and also with the government, the corruption, everything like that. Um, is it something that you've kind of got involved in, you just took a step back from, you know, obviously the things at the match, I mean, how... Have... Yeah, I've, I've, I mean, I did, I've done certain things back here, sorry, sorry uh, years ago with the, like, I helped out at deals, but just a shot when that was open, there was a guy called Jerry there and they had wristbands and things like that. So there was little things I'd volunteer to sort of you know, get involved in. I was always at the, the services, you know, I know, as John does himself, know a number of the family members and attended like the run for the 96 and things like that. Those those kind of things to, to always kind of be an earshot of, you know, if I'm needed for any support or helping anybody out kind of thing. Um, and as I say, I, I went to every single service when it was at Anfield every year. I, was, I made the point of making sure I was always at that. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of like where I've been with it. But as in like being an active full on campaigner as such no I've, I've not I've not done have that. you kept in touch with the guys from the, the campaign have you all there's people I've spoken to like yeah. Jerry passed away a few years ago but um, you know certain family members I, I, you know I, I do speak to and I'm still in touch with I only ask because I think it's just a, it's such a weird and it's probably a hard question probably a wrong question for me to ask of you and I apologise but I think it's it's such a weird kind of thing of like a I, I can see why people would maybe like you said before about like a guilt it's like how, how are you meant to live your life now? Are you meant to kind of, you know, never forget about it and talk about it 24-7 in memory? Or are you allowed to just write that, I don't want to speak about that no more? Or are you meant to write, no, we need to, you know, not let them tarnish our name. We need to... Mm. I, I feel like you, you're in such a horrible position where you've I, I kind of... I think it's important it's always spoken of because I think it's educating 100%. people. 100%. It's like anything, you know, the Holocaust, as I, I just use that as an example. You know, places like Auschwitz are so important mm. that people are educated so those things don't happen again. And I think the same stands for something like Hills, but I think people need to know the truth as much as possible. One, so we stop getting tarnished, and two, because because it was you know what the travesty that it was, and the system that we trust in, you know, being I mean? from yeah. the top all the way down. So, uh, you know, I think it's educating, it's making sure people know the story, and I'm always interested to read about it if it's somebody else's story and what they've gone through, and you know. Yeah, mm. yeah, for me, like I say, it's education, like, and, I, mm. and, and for me, it should form part of any scouse uh, oh, yeah. curriculum. Like, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. I'm quite relieved I haven't because I think it would have consumed me. I think, I think I'm that sort That's of That's what person. I mean. It's like, it's I'm that sort of person that would have been, I'm not going to say who, but we met one of the family members in, in something a, a few years ago, and then um, when we met her, we both walked away and went, 
That was hard, wasn't he? Mm. And, and what we meant was there was nothing else on her mind apart from mm. that. And you think, she must talk about this 24 hours a day. You know, it's been consumed her life to have that conversation. And and it's, that's really sad because she's never been able to move on. Mm. And, and like, probably, and probably hadn't, to be fair, and probably had not much of a life because that's all they, that's all they've been consumed by it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I've got that sort of say addicted personality when I'm in the gym or playing football or work or whatever. You've got that, and I think if it would have grabbed me to to do more of it. I think I would have been consumed by it too much, and I'm, I'm quite glad I wasn't. And maybe being a little bit younger, and at that time, I went from 16 to 17 really quick found dance music and lost a few years in a quad and stuff like that. <laughs> and then I found, hear a lot about this quad. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and then a few years later, sort of come back alive again. But, you know, within that period, I'm glad I was a little bit younger. Because, um, mm. yeah, but, but I've thought about this as well. And, you know, Joe, you're saying that before. It's I, We've all had these thoughts. He would have been the youngest person who died if he, if he would have perished on the day. You know, I know for a fact if I would have died, my dad would have been consumed by it. He's that sort of person. Like, he wouldn't never let that go. Never, never, never. He'd still be fighting all the way through. And his life would have been completely different to what, it, what it's been since. So not only the fact that he survived, but the fact that I know, looking at the, some of the families, mm. what his life would have been like. And, and that's not... not yeah, right. it's difficult, that, that, isn't that it? That aspect of it's quite sad, obviously. It is sad, them. yeah. But, but at the same time, it's kind of... If they hadn't done what they had done, would we still be talking about it now in the way we do? Mm. Yeah. We wouldn't have got the answers we got. I mean, yeah. when they led to the inquests and everything else, if people hadn't kind of had that determination in the within the families to kind of say, no, oh, fuck this, we're not letting this yeah. die, like, we're not yeah. letting this go away mm. until the truth comes out. And thank God for them, like, in the oh, way, they, know, they've been amazing. so sad that they've had to not only go through what they've gone through, but with regards to losing somebody, but every, obviously everything since, and the fact that it's probably consuming a lot of people mm. for the rest of their lives. But if they hadn't have had that, determination yeah. we probably would never have got to where we got to that was a funny one when we've met a few it was yeah. um uh the unbelievably thankful for yeah. like people like me and joe yeah. and we don't we don't see that we sit here and go oh my god you know you guys are going through so much and you know if there's anything that we can do and you know we're here for you and that sort of thing and they look at you funny like that and go what are you on about you used to what did you do and you were there you've been through it you could have helped my son daughter whatever you know and they look at they look at it a completely different way because they just look at it as that maybe not even they're not maybe not a victim they're just a victim of circumstance where you've been involved in a different way um which was really lovely actually mm-hmm. when they said things like because you don't think about yourself like you just you know we were the match and you guys must be horrible because you know you've gone through so much because you've lost someone who's died and they're like yeah but what about you sir you mm-hmm. know what about you too and we're like oh we'll be all right yeah it's that sort of side of it. yeah I'm, I'm conscious about it again i don't even know the legal ramifications so I'm conscious about asking about stuff like the inquest and stuff like that because I don't I don't, you know if you remember seeing on Twitter and stuff you can't you couldn't tweet certain yeah. things and stuff and I'm not sure about the whole so I'm scared to even mention it but just in a, in a general sense I mean what like, the the bitterness and the anger and stuff like that I mean what's your kind of view on things now with like with, with regards to you know where you're able to kind of I guess make peace where it's the wrong kind of way because there's there's always that injustice but I mean how do you kind of compliment, um, com- compartmentalise kind of you know? a lot of my closure because obviously I was so young was once I knew there's, there's the guy who saved me it was about I need to meet this man I need to shake this man's hand have a beer with him and find a closure in that respect you know when they came out and obviously the, the verdicts changed and everything else I remember I was sitting in the car when they were reading it out live on the radio and I just burst into tears and it was like a it was a sense of relief. It was like, fuck, no one thinks that of us anymore. Like, you know what I mean? Or if they do, they do. But we now know, and the world knows, this is the truth. Like, this is what actually happened. And that was a big relief for me. But my clo- closure of sorts came literally from meeting John, like, to find him and to be able to say thanks to him was the biggest thing for me. Because obviously I was so young, a lot of what went on, I got took away from, and fortunately didn't. I did see a lot, but. I didn't experience half of what John went through on the day. Like. It was a funny one for me. It was a uh, true story. This as well. I was, um, I was living in Australia. We lived in Australia for a few years, um, and then um, I was uh, going to going to work in the morning. So it would have been like evening this time. And I put the radio on, and they were bringing out the first results of the first the independent panel that gave the real results. 
and uh, I started crying in the car like I was breaking down so I pulled over pulled over inside the street sat there like that and I was in bits and I was like I can't believe this like it's it's actually the relief the relief we actually didn't do anything wrong I remember following my dad and just saying like we didn't do anything wrong did we like they proved it didn't they we, we didn't do anything wrong and he was like no we didn't you, we always know that John and blah 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 and that point was good I put the phone down true story looked out the window and the name of the road that was in was Anne Williams Drive true story that and I sat there and looked up and went no fucking way I remember sitting there taking a picture of it and I sent it to me my sister and like saying look where I'm sat right now I'm, I'm sitting here crying I'm in tears and I was looked up Anne Williams Drive in West Penn Hills in Sydney and I was just like no way bizarre that is but then the closure elements is um I think I was closed a number of years ago because I knew we were never going to win. Just knew it. Just knew we were never going to win. Ever in the sense of what was win for you, is it? Yeah, just the accountability and the, and the, and the, the the independent panel when that came back and those results. I think that was the win. I think that was the win mm. because you knew then that was an independent panel. I mean, the follow up accountability to it. Yeah, Joe, you are right. Sorry, cut me words. The follow up to that. No one was ever going to get prosecuted. No one's ever going to. No one's ever going to. Does that frustrate you? That because I, I, from someone who <clears throat> only knows of it from a scout and as a fan point of view, but then someone who looks at it is like, well, surely something's gone wrong and someone's you know accountable. Surely then, d- does that piss you? Or did, d- yeah, it annoys the hell out of me. I'm like, literally, it'd be a different conversation with me saying my dad because it makes him furious. Like, mm. he, like he, he loses head over it because he just can't understand the fit the fairness the fairness mm. you've done something wrong you need to take the consequence and whatever that consequence is that's the really logical sort of mindset that my dad's got and and I, and I think I sort of gave up on it because you just knew you weren't going to win on that accountability side of it so now I wouldn't say I was relaxed and when it comes up and you hear something and everything else brings everything back brings all your anger back brings all like the fear back brings everything back because you know no one's ever been really accountable for it which is terrible and like we've been there and been part of it but people have lost families and they've never really been able to lay them to rest in peace and people have died before them independent panels come back mm. so that they, mm. they've perished before the, any results have come to actually know that there was maybe a positive in it and then they've gone to the graves like that and now it's like that side of it is it's just terrible that's on on the notes and again you know something to fuck off but on a more personal point of views away from Hillsborough in the years that follow I mean have you has there been any you know downsides have you have you felt that it's you've, dra- you've dragged maybe that 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 with you it's affected your life I mean it, I mean I I had Hillsborough I was getting the, the small violin I was I lost my dad to suicide a couple of years after Hillsborough he wasn't at Hillsborough or anything like that but uh, so I kind of had that to deal with at a young age as well so I suppose moving forward I've always had that trauma element in my life and I do think it stems just from childhood experiences so that I've been if something bad's happened in my life I, I, yeah I've probably been a bit negative minded about it and gone oh rather than trying to turn it into a positive and look at the positive I've kind of let it cave me and, and consume me a little bit probably in the past Um, I've come out of that don't get me wrong but that's because as you get older and you find out you can speak to people and you get out and I have spoke to people about it but on the tra- trauma stuff that I've gone through in life and it's made a big difference for me but um yeah well, that's I can't I can't, I can't imagine like what you eight years older than at 11 as well like yeah, it was fucking traumatic, hell. like and you know I remember stupid things like I get into fights over nothing you know what I mean it could be nothing like you know mm. someone could just drop a coin next to me and I go well, I'm, not, I'm not a big lad at any but I'd just be like ah, like you know like I'd, I'd just go off quite easy and I had a teacher in school who kind of took me under his wing and sorted me out you know what I mean so I'd, but they'd be daft things like you you take you for a swim and then in the school bats and they'd be like oh you're dead lucky you get to go swimming fucking dead lucky you know what I was fucking tired and I'd, mm. and I'd be a bit of a shit like that kind of thing like and Again, I think I put that down to just the traumatic events and not having that kind of counselling or guidance mm. that you would probably get today, you know what I mean? So, mm. Do you find you quite chilled out now? Oh, God, I'm like a little hippie, I can't say. <laughs> 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 I, I think, mate, it's just... Quite yeah. now, we've yeah. got quite similar mindsets, I think, in, in what we, you know, childhood trauma, if you like. And I, I, 
it's not a good thing sometimes I'll have fucking you know a, a parking fine or something and I'll, I'll it's alright and then fucking it's gone up and my dad's like why don't you just sort it I'm like I'm just so chill about things mm. and it's probably not, not good sometimes <laughs> but, lift rocking up yeah I'm just not like and I think <laughs> the sofa's getting I'll be fine I think it's down to like just you know you've gone through some shit so when I have a bit of a bad day now I'm like listen it's not, not fucking really that bad, bad. Yeah, yeah. it's not that yeah. bad you know there's always someone worse isn't yeah. it yeah I, I think like- from my point of view it's um I think I had a number of traumatic years uh, afterwards when I really look back and reflect around, you know, no direction really in life. I mentioned this to you before, I always knew what I wanted to do as a kid from when I was like 10 or 11, and that journey changed because of Hillsborough, without a doubt. Um, and, and my mindset changed and my attitude changed to a lot of things. And I, I wasn't, when I look back now, probably not in a great space um, for a number of years. Because you really, at the same time, didn't have anyone to talk to. Because you know, you, you might speak to the girlfriend you're with or your mates and stuff, but it's not really talking to someone about mm. like you would do today around when your mates checking in on you. You know, are you really mm. all right? It was just like, oh yeah, come on, come for pints. No one really even talked about mental health, and you know, I'm, I would say I'm a big advocate of that now from a male point of view, especially when you can go back and talk to me. And I've got three sons, and that side of it is really, really important to me. So. And then I met my wife when I was about 24, um, and she's been a big sort of rock in my life because of that, um, through that whole period since. I was only young when we met, and she was only 20, um, and we've gone on to have four children, so my life afterwards, I can't say I've got regrets, because what I've got is outweighs everything else. You know? mm. Couldn't give a shit about the job anymore when you're thinking about where you are today. But I think it's changed a lot of your mindset in a lot of things, where you really really focused in some ways to achieve something and, and maybe that is something to say um, I am alive and there's a reason why I'm alive and I'm going to do something good with it mm. so that side of it is I've always been unbelievably career minded unbelievably competitive in anything I've ever done and that is I think was instilled more in me after Hill. So I'm making your mark type yeah, thing. Just like you know. I, I am going to do this and fuck you all I can do it and I'm going to show you how great I am even like teachers in school and stuff when you got your results. Now, this is a true story. Teachers in results and, you know, you took whatever it was in the August, so three months later or something, and they look at your results and go, oh, John, that's terrible, aren't it? You know, you could have done so much better than that, couldn't you? Yeah, they probably could have if they didn't see 96 people die two weeks before my exams, yeah? Mm. But that was the sort of conversation, and so it was like you're really disappointed and you've let yourself down and all that sort of stuff, and that stuck with you then as a consequence. So it was like, well, we'll see, you know, we'll mm. see. So we've, you know, that side of my life has, has been different, but there was a number of years when it was difficult, yeah, really difficult when I look back on it. Really tough few years, but now I try to be very open about, especially with the mental health side of it. I don't know if you've ever watched it, and I'm not plugging it, but that Roman Kemp thing he did the other day on Yeah, we are, what, with his, with his, um, his mate, mate to be with, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. I've not seen that, oh, no, I'll have to watch yeah. that. It's brilliant, honestly. Yeah. It's about male mental health, um, really good programme, uh, a number of things with it. And I think those things as well have been a huge advocate in my life for it since because, you know, having three lads as well and all 22 to 18, 19, it's, you know, it's difficult keeping an eye on them. Did this podcast for me, mate, that starts the, the 10 year anniversary getting blown up and um, me and Tom sit here and it's probably, it's this is so sad, the only two hour slot I have in my week where I don't touch my phone. Mm. You know, how often do you just sit there for two or three hours and not look at your phone? Me and Tom sit here, got to know Tom all about his life. He knows all about mine and we sit each week and get to know someone and we come back and we'll speak all through the week. God, fucking hell, that was yeah. interesting. That was mad, wasn't it? And so yeah. cathartic just to, for really fellas is. to sit around and talk, yeah. whether it's a cup of tea yeah. or beer. I have these two or three hours of the podcast and we said from day one I went if no one listens I couldn't give a fuck because I enjoy it yeah. <laughs> do you know what this, I mean this is feeling really good for me yeah, like exactly. really yeah. good for me to be able to even have that conversation mm-hmm. and endorse anyone that listens when you say that as well like it's still difficult for a male because like what are you going to do just walk in a booze with your mates oh, yeah. the match is on alright lads uh, you know you're alright yeah and that Roman Kemp says it's the two alright mm. but you're really alright like you get past yeah. the first one and just, yeah I'm fine yeah 
Yeah, but are you really? Mm. And he said he did that with one of his mates, and his mate just burst into tears on the second one. And it seems just like, I had to some, tell him something. But yeah, you're going to walk into the pub with your mate, sit down, the footy's on the telly, and you're not sat there and you're just going to start blaming yeah. out all the things that are wrong with you. Yeah. Well, you're not, because you're in the boozer for a, to have a good time. And So when do you ever get that opportunity it's so outside that to speak to your mate? It's so funny you said that. You know, when lockdown first did like a year ago, I was thinking, you know, I've got a couple of mates I'm, you know, can speak to like this, but I was thinking normally you go to the pub and you you see the lads or whatever it's not often that you go round to your mate's house and sit there with a cuppa or no. you might not have many of them where you can go round <laughs> yeah. and sit there and just go so how are you yeah <laughs> yeah. it's not that you go to a boozer you go I'm on my way get a pint yeah, who's yeah. F- on yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you're not like oh fucking hell I'm really st-. engaged in the car yeah yeah, yeah. as the, much as yeah. the one I said to all our lads the other week or, or my mates the other week was we need it sounds so bad this but you'll, it's exactly your point we need to find something that we do that doesn't involve alcohol mm. and I mean because everything we do together is like we'll go we'll meet up as, as a bunch of mates and we'll go to the pub to watch the match or we'll go and watch the album on the telly or we'll go and do this and it's all the time it's, it's in an environment where you want to have a good time do a podcast with a beer yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few of us go walking stuff like that do yeah. the mountains and stuff I know the mountains are great through. for it mate yeah, yeah done the mountains and we, we do that quite a lot and that's good because it's it's a few hours then yeah yeah and as soon as you commit to Snowden you're doing a four four and a half hour trip yeah. and, and you, you've got to do it together and you're there together and you're having that conversation there's nowhere to hide then either and no one's listening mm. apart from your mates who stood next to you so well, that, that's, that's what I think one. mate uh, and I don't just mean this podcast I mean me and Tom when we first started Tom used to message me every time we got like a nice message and uh, you stop doing I think we, thankfully you know it's been a success but it, there's that many of them now but people it's so cathartic listen, being part of the conversation even if you're just listening on a podcast mm. sometimes you can feel part of it and it'll make you then want to go mm. and speak about that to someone else and yeah, stuff do you know what I mean it's yeah. Yeah. And, and with something like this as well on the podcast thing is like you know I, I must have spoken on this specific podcast for about two minutes just because it's like a lot of the times if you're in a group you're trying to you know, there's an element sometimes of you all want to get the best stories and things like that where we can just listen here. There's mm-hmm. no, like, external pressure. You know, there's no, like, need to compete with stories. Like, I'm just fascinated just sat here in both of your company, just, enjoy. you know, I say enjoying it, but y- you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, like, yeah. just the, the story is just insane. And I think John Neal said that, didn't he? We had John Neal on last week, you know, proper old school scout storyteller, and he says, you know, I'm sure for any non scouts who's listening, it's the same, but in mo- sometimes in friendship groups, especially in Liverpool, how fast we all talk and everyone's funny, everyone's charismatic. It's like you've got a certain moment and oh, it's yeah. like you've got 30 <laughs> seconds, I need to say something good yeah. and if I don't, then I'm not going to get my chance again. So yeah. sometimes you, your yeah. own feelings can get drowned out a little bit. So the fact that you yeah. can sit there and for a couple of hours and go, you know, yeah. how are you and how did that feel and what was yeah, that it's like? So, it's important, like so important. Like, you know, because of what happened with my dad and the fact that he committed suicide, I've always been like an open book, you know, if I get upset because I've bent over and split my Kelvin clones, I'll phone someone. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'd like, I'll talk about anything, like, you know, if it makes brilliant. me feel better and it releases yeah. that emotion I'm carrying or I've got built up, you know. Mm. I just think it's the best way. Yeah, yeah. To, to kind so of, um, to kind of round things up, what, what is life like for you now then? What's 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 kind of your day to day? You still match going reds? You obviously right, use yeah. a, a mates now and yeah, stuff. I mean, what's... I, I don't sit far from you. I'm, I'm in um, block, whatever it is, 10 down the end. You've got nine in a in a change now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah we, you know what happens? I was with this fucking bit, bit of story. This I was with a missus, I, I, had, a, I had a missus, and um, we split up. I had a season ticket through here, half fella. <sighs> It was just as hard as the breakup losing. The <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, thankfully, I'm, I'm I'm back on the cop, just in a different spot now. Yeah, I've seen it a few times because we're in we're down the corner in ten. We had to move over from the from the Kenlin or the Lower Saint Anthony, old school, from the Kenlin into the main stand, and then uh, I'd like to say I've seen you on, on a couple of times there. Yeah, you know, and, um, I was in a good spot, mate, in the sense of um, yeah. it's good seat there. I always used to get on, you know, they used to do they do this inside LFC um, TV thing now yeah. and stuff, and you just see me sometimes go oh, fucking off. I was in like row row thirteen, I think yeah. it was, uh, as you're looking at the cop bottom left hand side. I I I still to this day turn my footy for a minute. Went Trent's on that corner quickly because yeah. we were just attacking with me and me mate Bobby uh, and Sean were next to me. And when it was another corner, they kind of like arms, on, hands on the head and they looked the other way. Because I was kind of facing this way, 
I swear I was like one of the few people who's seen like watching. that goal going. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because everyone else was kind of head and hands going. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't know, I, was, I, was, I was in Cuba on holiday when they watched that, that match. I was really? fucking gutted that I weren't there. And it was like, there was just no sports bars anyway. I was like, fucking hell, where am I going to watch the match? And then someone went, it's on, on the tellies in the room, you know, but it's just in Spanish commentary. So I said, like, I'll go and watch it then. Not thinking nothing, obviously, not, not yeah. as really. With that <laughs> start at 11 and everything that went, you know. Barca had had a week's rest and everything hadn't they yeah. into the game yeah, they rested their whole 11 yeah, didn't they? Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought there's no way like, but I'll go and watch it anyway and I just had a few few beers out the fridge and just sat on the floor and like my ex-partner come, comes in and I'm fucking crying on the floor they beat 6-0 this time what happened this time there's these two fucking horrible Tory fucking Fox hunting pricks, I'm proud to tell you that. From Southampton at the pool, giving me stick all week, all week. And I just walked straight out of the pool, ah, oh, pissed. And I, like, fucking hundreds of people around this pool, I'll take quiet and just chill. To, fucking get in there! Fucking get in there! Like, it's blasting the water. I'll just never I watched it, but then we played Newcastle after it, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. When the league yeah. scored, yeah. 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 we still had the chance to win the league. Yeah. And I managed yeah. to get that game on my phone, so I'm watching the phone at the pool, and that go and. Ah! No, we st- still got a match, yeah. Uh, I've had my season tickets since I was about fifteen and uh, there's been a number of years when through that in like oh one, two, three, something like that, we didn't miss a game on the way. Uh, went everywhere and then all of a sudden in the last couple of years it's got harder and the away is impossible like the mm. away is just impossible um, but every home game yeah and then in Europe if we make it anywhere then yeah any, anything that's good 100% we go yeah 100% we, we didn't I'm go best. Madrid couldn't get Madrid tickets yeah. for love nor money I mean, so we couldn't go there but we were in Kiev the, the, year, the year before and that was brilliant you know, that, mm. was, that Chef Kenko Park was just yeah know, Van Webster on Jay and he said, yeah. Jay said like just unbelievable it was unreal. Yeah. like the whole day like it's bizarre stories like but how do you get the match we left North Wales went to Glasgow flew from Glasgow to Malta spent four <laughs> days in Malta <laughs> spent four days on a piss in Malta because they were the only flights we could get that's what you tell your missus uh, four days in Malta on the piss with the Liverpool Supporters Club from Malta they had a chartered flight from Malta to Kiev they come, we come back from Kiev to Malta I then went Malta Italy Manchester got my suitcase and what do you do for a living and fucking hell I went to Australia <laughs> and then the lad the other two that were left had another night in Malta on the ale came back through um, where did they come back through Holland I think to get home um, but all that the, apart from the Australia bit the Kiev all the way through and there was about 350 because it was like a £7 flight from Presswich to Malta or something and, but it was just a bizarre journey yeah. and like when you put it all together some of the best journeys when you have are, are a bit mental like oh, that yeah. mm. and, and they're all good fun and all the way like met loads of people and stuff so yeah we still go to game and m- unbelievably passionate about everything that's going on with the club and especially even with this dip when you're um when you see who the real supporters are, really, when you've got these glory hunters who follow them and yeah. you don't know what dark days are like, especially following Liverpool. Know, um, yeah. And then, you know, they're, they're going to be all right. You know, the squad they've got and everything, but they're mm. just going to win the Champions League this year, without a doubt. Do you reckon, yeah? Oh, it's so it, it's many... Just um, Liverpool, that. It's just so many Liverpool. things, I think, so similar to 2005. Yeah. Honestly, I think Chelsea in the semis playing yeah. fucking awful final yeah. Istanbul just, just yeah. find out what Ken Barlow's up to on Corrie if he's getting married or something is he? <laughs> well, no, yeah there's a royal, royal wedding or a royal Ken son. Barlow's got his new undies on all the time it's like I used to love reading them yeah, yeah. on this day you know yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, do you I, sing to you Joe as well I play in a cavern yeah yeah, he's yeah. Good. I saw you know your bio yeah. he's Before, good you know honestly in the cavern. he's really good when it reopens anyway watch, watch yeah. your twitter and all that then so people can watch it and stuff well, on your life don't put anyone through that they'll have to, they'll have to listen to me for the last couple of hours <laughs> <laughs> but he's just joined Twitter quite recently so so, yeah, is there that he's want to plug lads to finish off and uh, well my lad do you know what he's, he's told me to plug his Twitch but, uh, whatever that is he's streaming that on the Fuck Playstation knows. or something he, did, like, and, get and on... he said he's Blacklight 25 or something I, I've got no idea what that means yeah. but he reckons that I think that's get his, on if you're on Twitch. handle or something he's not, he's not uh, one of them 
watches other people play on. Oh, the no, he, no, he, no, he, he plays, plays it. Buy, and buy, 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 that, buy that seventy-five quid game. Yeah. So you buy them in, and then you go on YouTube and watch someone else playing so it. It's people watching it. Yeah. So people are e streaming in playing COD, and then the other people log in. And so your lad is paying. Yeah. He's still sat there. He's still sat there. He's still sat there. He's still sat on the coffee table but it's like it's on Sky now as well isn't it people yeah. play oh yeah mate it, some, some people off Twitch make some serious amount yeah. of money a month it, here's one for you then right I um, not to sound all big time but Nike flew me over to uh, China to do motivational talk their idea of like a you know big company piss up type thing was they had two big massive screens right and then they said right guy obviously like 700 people in working for Nike there was two tables in front of the screen and like they had teams of five go up and play computer games and the computer games was then streamed on these big screens and there's fucking 700 people watching these two screens of people playing this fucking game against each other against each other and i'm sitting there fucking thinking this is going to be a good piss up this <laughs> Get on watching <laughs> yeah. those five fucking computer geeks versus those five fucking computer geeks I'm in Shanghai I'm thinking and honestly it's fucking massive over yeah. there mad city darling there's stuff money in there as well oh yeah, yeah. it's fucking oh, yeah. crazy money yeah. huge money yeah. they've, 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 I'm sure the fella has got yeah. more Instagram followers than like fucking Ronaldo yeah. or something well, one of them is um, one of the is it one of the ES sports has got a bigger budget than something like Chelsea. I'm not joking. Oh, I can believe it, yeah. yeah, yeah. They're treating like professional now, yeah, so they have yeah. to eat at a certain fucking time, idiot, train yeah. at a certain time, play at a certain time. Honestly, it's fucking the money behind, I don't get me a town, dude. Like, I don't get it either. I've never, I've never been a gamer. Do you reckon you'll well. do anything for Alex the Kid? You could play Alex the Kid or something. Pit Duckham, I was going to say. Just fucking up the gun right on the telly. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, what was that game he, that, uh, that come with the computer? Um, was it Alex, Alex the Kid? It was, wasn't it? Alex the Kid yeah. built it, yeah. No, but yeah, no, if, if there is anyone who's booking any bands, though, we are on Facebook. Smokestack, Smokestack Band Live. So if anyone is booking... The brilliant, honestly. The brilliant book, come and play a gig for oh, us. Yeah. Yeah. Lads, it's, it's, it's been genuinely one of me... Um, that's fucking a bit emotional at times there. Yeah, I've yeah. managed to um, but pull it together. But honestly, lads, it's... Um, what a, what, a, yeah. what a privilege to fucking have you in there lads honestly real Should pleasure for, for over two yeah. hours as well I can't pre- you know so much thank, to be honest so that's much. quite short if anyone knows me you've <laughs> done well to cut it down to <laughs> two hours just, we should keep going you know it's loads <laughs> more yes well I'm looking forward to going for a pound I'll eat more but no lads thank you so much yeah thank cheers, you so much no cheers guys thank you very much cheers